Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Build. You know, yesterday, Satya talked about our three core ambitions as a company, and Terry talked about the great work we're doing in Windows to enable more personal computing. And today, I'm going to continue the conversation uh, by talking about the work we're doing with Azure to build the intelligent cloud. Chi Lu will then build on top of that and talk about uh, the great opportunities we're enabling for developers with Office. And then Steve Guggenheimer and John Chuchuk uh, will finish up with a keynote this morning that highlights some of the great end-to-end -end experiences uh, that developers have built across all three ambitions. So let's go ahead and start to talk, and talk about Azure. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud computing platform. It enables you to move faster and do more. Azure is a hyperscale cloud platform. And over the last several years, we've been hard at work expanding Azure to run all over the world. You know, the circles here uh, on this map indicate what we call Azure regions, which are made up of clusters of data centers where you can basically run and deploy your code. And we now have 30 unique Azure regions around the world. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's more locations than Google and AWS combined. And this enables you to run your applications closer to your customers and to your employees than ever before and compete in even more geographic markets. Now, what makes each of these regions uh, pretty impressive is just the sheer size of them. Uh, this photo right here is uh, just one of our US East data centers. Uh, I just give you a sense of the facility. That little circle on the bottom right is a very large truck. And this is the same region from a different angle, and it kind of shows you the build out that's currently underway. Uh, this region will ultimately, this data center will ultimately be more than a mile long. And we're continuing to invest billions of dollars to build out infrastructure like this all over the world. And our cloud platform you know, now manages more than a million servers. And this enables you to build apps without having to worry about your cloud platform's capacity, and enables you to build apps and scale your solutions to literally any size. You know, we're seeing tremendous adoption of Azure right now. And we often hear from customers that there are three main reasons why they're choosing Microsoft. You know, Azure offers the choice and flexibility of a full spectrum cloud. Uh, you can start from scratch for new greenfield projects, or easily leverage existing investments and skills. You know, Azure's open and supports the ability to target multiple devices, uh, multiple, use multiple operating systems, programming languages, frameworks, data services, and tools. And this slide here just highlights some of the technologies uh, that you can leverage to build Azure applications today. With Azure, you can literally uh, take advantage of the best of the Windows ecosystem and the best of the Linux ecosystem together. Now, Microsoft's one of the only hyperscale cloud vendors out there. And unlike any of the others, we're unique in that we enable our cloud solutions to be deployed not just in our hyperscale cloud data centers, but also in your own data centers as well as service provider data centers as well. And our Azure Stack offering enables you to stand up a consistent cloud platform experience on premises with the same management API, the same portal, the same set of developer services that's available in our core public cloud Azure. And this provides customers with the maximum flexibility uh, to basically journey to use the cloud and enables them to basically use a common set of skills and assets along the way. You know, for us, enterprises are not an afterthought. Uh, they're a key design point. And it's not just about the technology. Uh, Microsoft has decades of experience supporting businesses and enterprise customers of every size. And we have tens of thousands of uh, support professionals who understand and support enterprises around the world today. This means we really understand the critical uh, requirements of running software for businesses, uh, including things like certifications, data sovereignty, security, and privacy. Uh, for example, Azure now has more compliance certifications than any other public cloud vendor, and Azure is also the only uh, global public cloud vendor that has a license to operate in mainland China. 85% of Fortune 500 companies today are now running their businesses using the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, these are just a handful of the logos that are running on Azure today. And Azure provides the best cloud platform, not just for enterprises, but in particular for software developers who want to target enterprise customers uh, and deliver their solutions to them. And throughout today's keynote, you'll hear from customers uh, talking about the great things that they're doing with Azure and the reasons why they picked it. Now, Microsoft got its start serving developers. Our very first product as a company was a product targeted for developers. And making developers successful uh, with great platforms and tools remains central to our company's uh, overall mission. And we're relentless about taking the latest technologies uh, and making them accessible to the broadest set of developers out there in the world. And our aim is to help you build better apps even faster. 
You can choose to use Azure just for infrastructure uh, and use it for base compute, storage, and virtual machines. But you can also take advantage of a coherent set of highly engineered and fully managed services to build your apps even faster. And our cloud platform and tools together deliver unmatched productivity and enable you to move faster and be even more successful. And over the last 12 months, we've delivered hundreds and thousands of new features and services uh, with Azure, and the pace of innovation continues to accelerate. Uh, and as we've delivered all these capabilities, we're really seeing the usage of Azure continue to skyrocket. Uh, we now have more than 120,000 new Azure customer subscriptions being created every single month. And those customers are creating some truly amazing applications. We have more than 1.4 million SQL databases uh, being hosted now within Azure to run applications there. More than 2 trillion IoT messages each week uh, are now being processed by our Azure IoT system. More than 5 million organizations and enterprises are now using our Azure Active Directory. Uh, and this is great not just for them, but again for developers, it makes it incredibly easy for you now to deliver SaaS-based applications uh, to target uh, all those enterprises in a really easy way. More than 4 million developers are registered now with our Visual Studio Team Services, which is our online suite of developer SaaS offerings. And we're seeing growth and traction not just with enterprises and business users. In fact, more than 40% of our Azure usage uh, comes from startups and ISVs. And behind all this large momentum uh, numbers are some truly amazing customer stories and people that are really taking advantage of all this technology to deliver great things. And for the rest of today's keynote, we're gonna dive in and explore this technology uh, and highlight some of the great new enhancements that we're announcing today and, and coming out this week, and then really highlight a whole bunch of great customer success stories talking about how they're taking advantage of that technology to transform their businesses. Let's go ahead and start by talking about web and mobile. You know, one of our most popular services in Azure today is our Azure App Service offering. Uh, Azure App Services provides a rich set of cloud capabilities that enable you to build and scale the backends for both web and mobile solutions anywhere in the world. We're seeing some fantastic apps that have been built with it. Last month, we announced that Microsoft was acquiring Xamarin. Uh, and this, it, Xamarin is a leading platform provider for mobile app development and enables developers to deliver fully native mobile app experiences to all major devices, including iOS, Android, and Windows. And it's the perfect complement uh, to a back-end cloud. You know, more than 1.3 million unique developers have used Xamarin, and companies who've adopted Xamarin really span every single industry out there. They range from startups like Slack and Pinterest uh, to enterprises like Coca-Cola, Alaska Airlines, and Honeywell. And what I thought I'd do is actually just uh, show a quick video of a couple of Azure, Xamarin customers talking about why they use Xamarin and why they love it. Xamarin allows our team to get to market faster than our competition. Xamarin is a platform that works for native development on iOS, Android, and Windows. It allows us to not need to focus on all the different development tools but allow us to write a better code and provide better features. Xamarin Test Cloud allows us to push our app to over 2,000 real devices, both mobile phones and tablets, across a matrix of operating systems and device types so that we can get the kind of coverage we would never be able to support in-house. Pinterest is a very visual tool to be testing, so Xamarin makes sense in terms of its live devices testing the, the physical app just like a user would use it. Working with Xamarin Test Cloud is giving us the confidence to get to our next 100 million users. With 2.3 million daily active users, there are a lot of people that rely on Slack. Finding issues and bugs and being able to report that really shows the value of the automation that we're building. The Xamarin Test Cloud had a, the ability to run our automation against a huge, huge device library that they offered, as well as the reporting back that Xamarin gives us after the tests are complete is very detailed, allows us to look at different types of app usage data, battery usage data, and then of course looking at the actual stack traces of failures and logs was extremely important as well. We have a great collaboration with LEGO, which is trying to enable students to find that love of engineering through robotics. The combination of Visual Studio, .NET, and Xamarin provide that very scalable bridge from desktop to mobile. If I can write one piece of code and it works everywhere, that makes me very happy. Xamarin is sick. It's crazy the kind of stuff you can do with this product. Xamarin enables developers to build fully native mobile apps using C-sharp. 
Uh, Xamarin's approach enables developers to take advantage of the productivity and power of .NET uh, and to use C Sharp to also write to the full set of native APIs and mobile capabilities provided by each device platform. You know, and this enables developers to easily share common app code across iOS, Android, and Windows apps, while still delivering the fully native experiences for each platform. And what I'd like to do is invite Miguel on stage to show off just how easy it is to get started with Xamarin and build a very first project with it, and how powerful a development experience it is. Here's Miguel. Thank you, Scott. Hello. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, at Xamarin, we're very excited to be joining, uh, to be joining Microsoft. And, uh, and personally, I am very happy to uh, finally be joining the team that created the .NET framework. Uh, but, also, uh, but also to complete the, the longest job interview of my career. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yesterday, Kevin showed you the My Health application. It's a cross-platform app, mobile app, that runs on Android, Windows, and iOS. And it delivers a native experience on each one of those platforms. It's written entirely in C Sharp uh, by sharing a piece of the code and delivering native experiences on each one of those. So what I want to do today is show you just what the experience is for Visual Studio developers uh, to, create window, uh, to create iOS applications and Android applications. Uh, from Visual Studio. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a project. And, and here on the, on the template selector, I just go to iOS, iPhone. There's templates for iPhone, iPad, and other things. And I'm just going to pick this one, the single view app. There's other templates for your apps for you to choose as well. So <clears throat> I'm going to get started uh, by editing the user interface for my project. I'm going to open the storyboard, which is iOS's native uh, file format for, uh, for UI design. And uh, to, showcase, uh, uh, to showcase this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a very simple label to my screen. Here, I'm going to put this guy here. And then I'm going to resize it. Um, and then I'm going to give it a name so I can refer to it from my code behind code. I'm going to call this my text. And then I'm also going to pick a map. Um, this is um, the iOS map view. I'm just going to position this guy here. You might be thinking, I've never seen a phone, a square phone. This is Apple's way of ensuring that your application works on small form factors or big form factors. So you have to design your app with this in mind. Now I'm going to go to the code behind uh, for, this, uh, for this, and I'm going to hook up some events to my map. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my map, and you get the usual uh, Visual Studio Code completion here. And everything that you see here, you'll see that these are actually uh, the reflected properties of everything from the native APIs. These are the accessibility APIs in iOS. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up to the region changed event. Uh, so that means that whenever I move the map and the map uh, 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 changes, uh, this method will be invoked. I'm just going to press tab here. I get my usual Visual Studio uh, 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 features here. So I'm going to uh, call these methods changed. And now I'm going to go here and implement uh, the behavior uh, for this. So every time that the map changes, I'm just going to update the text on the UI. I'm going to use a little bit of a C Sharp 6 here just to show off uh, that I've actually been keeping up with the blog posts. My map dot, uh, region dot center, And I'm going to display the longitude. All right. So um, the. Uh, so that's it. I think I'm just going to run this thing. So you just hit build the same way that you would do it with any other project. Um, there's really not a lot of magic here. Uh, the build gets started. The build is happening uh, partially on Windows and partially on the Mac computer. Um, and uh, usually, this is a step where I have to ask somebody backstage, hey, can you uh, just uh, switch my computer to the Mac? But uh, today, we're showing you the iOS simulator remoted to the Windows. And this is great because you no longer have to invest in a chair that spins. Um, um, so you can do it all from here. Now, uh, I can use this. Uh, since I'm using a Surface computer, I can usually use my finger here. And you see how the, the longitude is updating. Um, so I can just use my finger to do this. And also, we forward all multi-touch events. So this is something that no iOS simulator has ever been able to do before. I mean, you can see it, but I'm using my fingers here uh, to pinch. Very nice, very nice. 
Now, it wouldn't be Visual Studio if uh, you couldn't set breakpoints on this live. So I'm going to do a little bit of movement here. And uh, you'll see the breakpoint hit. Um, and it wouldn't be Visual Studio if you couldn't just explore uh, all of your objects as they go. So everything that you see here, this is the my text variable. And you can see all the native, uh, all the native references, like the UI font, the mutable string. So everything that you know uh, uh, and everything that the native platform surfaces is integrated directly into .NET. So, so this is what I wanted to show you on the iOS side of the house. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, this is going to be a lot of learning. There's going to be a lot of learning of new APIs and models. Um, so what we started to do is, uh, is we thought that there was a better way for learning APIs on Android, iOS, and even Windows. And, uh, and we decided to leverage the work that the Roslyn team has done. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, is a nicely rendered page of our new documentation. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at the documentation for how to animate views in Android, how to perform uh, nice animations on Android. And uh, this is written in Markdown. There's really no magic here. Uh, but you see that there's pieces of code that show you how to do things. So in this example, we're going to show some work clocks, and we're going to do some animations. Um, but let me show you, let me show what we're going to do here. Um, let me resize this window so you can get a taste for this. And uh, what you see here is the Android emulator actually running that document, and it's running it live. So if I make a change here, right, because I'm learning this API and I hit Shift Return, the color changes. And uh, what we've done is we started to create some exercises for people to learn how to use it. So there's a whole chapter in animation. This is how you do it. These are the properties that you can change. This is the method that does it. And, uh, and we have some exercises here. In this particular case, it says animate the rotation of the clock. All right, so maybe we can animate that rotation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the clock here. I'm going to change the clock here. And, uh, and you see that I get code completion. This is Rosling providing the code completion. So I'm going to start with a, a rotation of 90 degrees so it can be very obvious what's happening. So I just press Shift Return. The code re-executes immediately. Now, <laughs> all my clocks are rotated. That is not what I intended. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add the rotation back to 0. And just so you get a, little bit sense, uh, a better sense of what's happening, I'm going to increase the rotation time, the duration to uh, to one second. And when I re-execute it, it's right there. So we're very excited about this. It's a Markdown, Roslyn, C Sharp, all targeting Android, iOS, and Windows. Uh, thank you. It's great to have Miguel and the whole Xamarin team be part of Microsoft. It's, uh, it's uh, awesome. Uh, to have them be part of the .NET framework. Now, one of the questions I get asked, uh, I've been asked a lot since we announced our intention uh, to acquire Xamarin was, so what's the pricing for Xamarin going to look like now that it's part of Microsoft? And we officially closed the Xamarin acquisition about 10 days ago, uh, and so we can now officially share our plans. You know, starting today, uh, I'm pleased to announce we're going to be making Xamarin available at no extra charge to every Visual Studio customer. <laughs> This includes uh, developers using Visual Studio Enterprise Edition. This includes developers using Visual Studio Professional Edition. And this also includes developers using the free Visual Studio Community Edition. <laughs> MSDN subscribers will also get Xamarin Studio on the Mac. Uh, included as part of their MSDN subscription. And we're also today releasing a new free edition of Xamarin Studio on the Mac that we call Xamarin Studio Community Edition, which is available with full feature set for every independent developer and small team out there to build great apps. I 
I like all these applauses. This is cool. Ah. But, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Like we've already done with ASP.NET, uh, Entity Framework, C Sharp, Roslyn, and the core.NET runtime, uh, we're also going to be making Xamarin's core platform open source and contributing it as part of the .NET Foundation. <laughs> this means everything you need to run a Xamarin app on any OS, any device, uh, is now open source. Uh, and you know, we think this makes Xamarin an even more attractive platform uh, to do native mobile development. It also means that .NET now is fully open source, uh, fully cross-platform, uh, and it's a development framework that can be used to build applications on any device and on any back-end operating system. I'm also really excited to share that today, uh, Unity, JetBrains, and Red Hat are also joining the .NET Foundation. Uh, it's great to see you know, the energy and enthusiasm for .NET and C Sharp uh, continue to grow more and more since we made our announcement about 18 months ago to opensource.net. And we think with today's announcements, we're going to increase that energy even further. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be a .NET developer, uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing some fantastic apps be built. So, you know, building great mobile solutions uh, requires more than just a process for doing development. It also requires that you test them, you deploy them, and you use analytics on a, a continual basis to make them better. And uh, the Xamarin Test Cloud service is a really great solution that enables mobile developers to easily test their mobile apps. Uh, with the Xamarin Test Cloud, you can, in fact, upload any mobile app, uh, not just ones written in C Sharp, uh, but also native Xcode, Java, Android, HTML, Cordova apps, and automate the testing of them across thousands of real devices that are hosted all in the cloud. The Xamarin Test Cloud service uh, integrates extremely well with our existing Visual Studio Team Services offering, as well as the Hockey App uh, solution that's also now part of Microsoft. And combined, they deliver a complete end-to-end -end mobile DevOps solution. Uh, you can host code repositories in the cloud using VSTS, using either Git or TFS, uh, enable automatic continuous integration with our hosted build solution, which leverages thousands of servers running in the cloud to build your code without you having to manage any infrastructure yourself. It helps automate both unit testing and device testing now with the Xamarin Test Cloud. And you can then deploy and monitor mobile apps using Hockey App to all your beta testers and other uh, customers. The end result is an incredibly powerful end-to-end -end offering that can be used for literally every type of mobile project out there. What I'd like to do is invite Donovan on stage to show it off. Thank you, Scott. It is such an exciting time for DevOps right now. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. With Visual Studio Team Services and the addition of Xamarin and Hockey App into the Microsoft family, we have everything that you need to enable DevOps at your organization. The cool thing is, is there's nothing to install, there's no de devices to buy, and there's no VMs to manage, because we host it for you in the cloud. All you have to do is focus on your application and leave the rest to us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the app that we showed you yesterday, the Microsoft Health app. I'm just going to rub a little DevOps on it and make it better. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to begin with testing, which is an incredibly important part of any DevOps process. Creating tests can be very difficult, but with the Xamarin Test Recorder, we make it extremely easy. I can either use an Android emulator like I have here, or actually physically attach a device to my computer. And then all I have to do is use the application. As I click on it, it will actually start to record my actions. As I start to enter information, all that information gets captured for me. And as I use it, it's automatically tracking my actions and recording them, and even generating code for me. This code, I can check into my version control and use it in my CI and my CD pipelines. Well, this is where Scott told me to pause for applause, so I think that's your cue to clap. So, if I pause later on, I'd probably just start clapping. 
Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna be able to export this directly to the test cloud, which you just talked about. The test cloud will allow me to use this test against thousands of physical devices. When I actually jump over to the test cloud, what you're gonna see is the ability for me to actually filter, say I only want to look at phones, and I wanna see the most popular phones. And this shortcut lets me say, I wanna run my test on the top 10 devices in that particular category. Now what I can do is simply go ahead and select those devices, and when I click on Done, the Xamarin Test Cloud is taking my code, taking my test, and uploading it for me to the cloud. It is also provisioning all the devices that I asked for and executing my test on those physical devices. Now the power here is when we actually go back in and look at an existing test run. Here I have one that's very interesting because I had two tests that failed. Man, the test cloud makes diagnosing problems extremely easy and powerful. As you can see on the left-hand side here, my history test failed. Now, what I can do is if I click on the left-hand side here, I can navigate through all of the different screens of my application. And on the right-hand side, the actual phones are updating, showing me exactly what I should be seeing. But when I get to this step here, all of a sudden, one of them does not match. It was able to identify that there's something wrong, and I need to draw your attention to this. If I need to, I can just click on it and drill in and see a really nice image. Now, an image is good, but a video? A video would be better. And what I can do is pick any step in this list that I'd like to, go ahead and click on playback, and now I'm actually watching a video of that application being tested. I'm gonna pause the video because I, what I really wanna show you here is the fact that there's so much information at my fingertips. I can actually look at the memory usage, I can look at the CPU usage, or I can even download device logs and test logs. So I can go ahead and pinpoint exactly what went wrong and then go back in and fix that so that my developers and my testers and my users get the best experience that they possibly can. Now this is great, but imagine a world where this happens every single time you check in code. Every change being validated against thousands of devices. Well, that day is today. Because with Visual Studio Team Services, we give you the ability to do this throughout your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. Visual Studio Team Services is everything that you need to turn an idea into a working piece of software for any language targeting any platform. This is extremely powerful stuff. We don't care if it's Android or iOS. We don't care if it's Java or JavaScript. And what we're looking at here is a Kanban board, which allows me to visualize my ideas from inception all the way to completion. I can go ahead and add new ideas to the board if I'd like to. I can go back here and actually break down existing items. And what I really love about this is the ability for me to go ahead and create a brand new branch of code in TFVC or in Git to isolate these changes until I feel that they are ready. And when they are, I will merge them back into the master branch and kick off a continuous integration build. If you've ever seen me present before, you know I like our CI system because it allows me to build anything I want, anywhere I want. Fun fact, the first time I installed Linux was after I joined Microsoft. Let that sink in for a second. It is a new age for Microsoft. Why would I install Linux after joining? Because our tools work happily on Linux on Mac and on PC. So I had to make sure I understood that world so that our tools worked perfectly in that world as well. So what we have here is a build definition and it does lots of cool stuff for me. It manages my licenses for me, it resolves all my NuGet packages, and it allows me to build on any platform that I want. But building it is only half of what I wanna do. I also need to test it. So remember those tests that I just created earlier? Every time I check in my code, I can actually run those tests in the test cloud immediately. <laughs> the end result is this screen here. This is a screen that's the build summary that brings together all the value that I've been talking to you about. The work items that I showed you are actually displayed on the screen because it knows what I was working on when I actually created this build. It can actually tell me every commit to code that I made to make sure that they were made correctly. The code that I uploaded to the Xamarin Test Cloud and executed there, those results have now been brought back down into Visual Studio Team Services, completing that loop for me. If I need to go back and look at those videos, the link is directly here for me as well. 
and I'm going to move this code through a pipeline. I know what you're thinking right now. Your mind is blown, because this is incredible, incredible stuff. Microsoft is changing the rules for DevOps. We're enabling it for everyone, everywhere. And what I love about this is we can actually deploy this code for you as well. So what I'm going to be able to do here is see very quickly. In version 25, that's in production right now. Version 26 is making its way through my alpha and my beta testers. Now, how did I get it to them? I got it to them using release management. Release management allows me to not only deploy my front end using some really hot technology from Hockey App, a startup that we acquired about a year ago and is tightly integrated with the Visual Studio Team Services. I'm also able to deploy my databases, my web services, the infrastructure that is going to actually support my mobile application is all being deployed for me automatically. When release management runs, my testers get notifications on their phones, allowing them to instantly see there's a new version, and also allows them to go ahead and download that. Hockey App springs into action and starts collecting device information. It starts collecting analytics on the user. It starts telling us about all the sessions that we have and even tracking crashes. All that information is then surfaced for me here in the Hockey App portal. I can see all the information that I just mentioned, and I can even drill down into a particular crash. If I look at a crash, I can see exactly how many times it's happened, and if I need to, even get down into a stack trace. So before I leave, I just want to reiterate, all this power is available for everyone on any language targeting any platform. There is nothing to install, there are no devices to purchase, and there's no VMs to manage, because we handle it for you. Here at Microsoft, we create the products that are going to shape your process and enable your people to do amazing, amazing things. Thank you so much. So Donovan showed you the power of using the cloud, and specifically Visual Studio Team Services, the Xamarin Test Cloud, and Hockey App to really make developers and development teams much more productive. And the great thing about Visual Studio Team Services is you can enable this not just for mobile solutions. Uh, you can use it for every app type and every development project, including for projects uh, that aren't yet deployed to the cloud and where you want to basically deploy them back to an on existing on-premises environment. And we're seeing organizations of all sizes, including some of the very largest enterprise customers, starting to use Visual Studio Team Services for all their work. You know, Shell is one of the largest and best run IT organizations in the world and is making a big bet on the Microsoft Cloud. What I thought I'd do is watch a quick video of their experiences as they're adopting Visual Studio Team Services for all the developers inside Shell. Shell's overall mission is to be the most innovative and competitive energy company in the world. By 2050, our population is around 9 billion, and for that, we need a lot more energy than we need today. Technology will clearly help Shell in meeting these challenges. We have about 2,800 software developers working day in, day out. Our overall strategy is to move everything to the cloud as soon as we can. We gathered up our Team Foundation server databases, sent them off to Microsoft where they ran their high-fidelity migration processes and transformed it all into Visual Studio Team Services. I was pretty unenthused when I heard we had to move to Visual Studio Team Services. Any change is hard. The rollout was phenomenal. We were able to just log on, update, move to the new system. I didn't have to rebuild my code. It's just really easy to work with. Our software being developed for various platforms. It could be for Linux, for Windows, for Apple iOS, for Android, for other type of devices. So having access to the latest software releases is very important to us. Now with Visual Studio Team Services, every three weeks there's new functionality without us even noticing it. We're no longer running our servers, we've removed all of that cost. Obviously going to the cloud, people are mostly concerned with security. So the fact that the Visual Studio Team Services had their ISO certification in place was a, a great benefit for us. Digitalization will transform every part of the company. It will overlay our physical world and make it one world. Whether in the subsurface space, whether in the refining space, whether in the trading space, Space, but in the consumer space, it will transform the whole company. So now that we've covered some of the mobile work we're doing, let's switch gears now and talk about another of our advanced workloads in Azure, which is IoT. Now, there are going to be more than 20 billion internet-connected devices in the world in just four years' time. And integrating the additional data and insights from these billions of devices uh, deep into your applications and business processes, it's going to completely transform your solutions. It's going to fundamentally change the way we also all live and work. 
We introduced our Azure IoT offering two years ago. It provides an incredibly rich set of IoT capabilities that can be used uh, across a wide variety of different IoT scenarios, including both consumer and commercial use cases. This slide here highlights just some of the great companies who have built and deployed some amazing solutions using Azure IoT. And what we'd like to do is invite one of those companies on stage uh, to talk about the great consumer experiences they're building with Azure IoT. Please join me in welcoming Tom Brenner from BMW. Hello and good morning, everyone. This is super exciting. Thank you, Scott, for inviting us here to speak about um, digital services at BMW. Our vision at BMW, really about seamless mobility in the future, has three important pillars. And digital services is one of the pillars. But the really key about that vision is, and you see that on the slides in the background, to bring all those pillars to life together. And to give you a little bit of a glance of how that could look like in the future, Let's roll the movie. Good morning, David. Your first meeting today will be at 9.30 downtown with Mr. Brannigan. Would you like to choose your driving options? Decker Canyon with the I-8 will be a joyride this morning. Yes, thanks for the suggestion. Be careful, David. There's a rock slide ahead. Call Caroline. Hello, David. How are you? Hi, Caroline. Fine. Thank you. I sent you an email with the two possible headline press pictures. Is it possible for you to take a look at them right now? I'll look at them when I arrive at the office. We should go for lunch when I'm back in Munich next week. I see Thursday could work. It does. Looking forward to it. There's traffic ahead. To keep your estimated arrival time, I suggest leaving the highway at exit 5 for an alternative route downtown. I want one of those cars. <laughs> So BMW clearly has a bold vision, uh, and it sounds like as part of that vision, you're really making a big shift from building services just for cars to also integrating the car into the overall customer digital experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, sure. So the customer really and the mobility needs and the services the customer is using is really in the center and in the heart of our digital services vision. In the future, we believe um, sheer driving pleasure will be more than driving. For our customers, mobility starts before they actually enter the car, and it doesn't stop after they leave the car. The car and the BMW will become the ultimate smart device, perfectly integrated into your digital lifestyle. And it will connect and integrate the smart devices we're using today and the devices we'll be using tomorrow. So can you tell us a little bit more about the BMW Open Mobility Cloud and how you're enabling these experiences? Absolutely, Scott. So to enable these type of experiences, you can't build an app anymore. We're really thinking about across touch points, and we build a highly flexible service architecture for BMW that we call Open Mobility Cloud. It's pro it provides us cloud capabilities and big data services with analytics and machine learning, and it also allows us to create new experiences, personalized and contextual, together with service partners, and to connect the devices of the future. And, and how did you use Azure to build the BMW Open Mobility Cloud? Azure really, for us, provided the tool set to build this type of flexible architecture and scale it to our needs. As you can see on the slide in the back, we pretty much use um, any other, uh, a lot of Azure, Azure services. And the key is really Azure's breadth of capabilities has allowed us to build that type of platform. Can you tell us about the customer experience uh, in this first release that you built on top of these technologies? What are some of the exciting announcements that you're making today? Absolutely. I mean, we built this whole technology stack to build great experiences for our customers. And those experiences built on top of the Open Mobility Cloud are called BMW Connected. The first version of BMW Connected will focus really on managing daily mobility needs. 
It will put all your destinations in one place, no matter what source the destination came from. It will make it accessible, including estimated drive times in your car, in your dashboard, and outside of your car, on your phone. It will smartly learn your routine drives and will notify you ahead of time if unexpected traffic is ahead and you need to leave early, for instance, to drive to work or to pick up your kids from school. It will tell you when to leave about on scheduled destinations that could be basically coming from your calendar, for instance. And in case you get delayed while you're driving, there's a really easy way to let family, friends, and friends know when, you're gonna, when they're gonna expect you. And we also integrated remote services, like locking your car. So BMW Connected becomes really one app. You don't need to switch around anymore. And the best thing is, all BMW owners and Connected Drive customers in the US can download the first version of BMW Connected for the iPhone today. You can expect frequent updates from us, like any other internet company. We will be expanding the service and adding new capabilities step by step towards the vision together with our customers and users. So please come down and visit us downstairs at this awesome white BMW 7 Series to learn more. And thank you, Scott, for inviting us to this amazing show. Thank you for building on Azure. Thank you. So BMW is a great example of a customer using Azure IoT and the overall Azure platform to significantly enhance the consumer experiences of the products and services they deliver. Uh, Schneider Electric is another leading energy provider uh, who is using Azure IoT to significantly enhance their commercial services as well. Let's take a quick look uh, and video at their solution. Schneider Electric is a global provider of energy management and automation solutions. We're in multiple industries from smart cities, connected oil fields, mining minerals and metals, food and beverage processing, everything from mass market all the way to connected and efficient homes. We've been creating smart devices for years. When we add onto that the connected smart device and all the data that we can collect from those devices, and we start to look at new revenue models, new business models that we can deliver, it was a natural fit for us to embrace IoT as the next step for Schneider Electric. And it helps a lot that Microsoft is targeting the enterprise like ourselves so that they can bring their expertise of consolidation and engineering efficiency to what we are doing as a group. Azure IoT provides us with a very open, flexible, highly scalable platform. We can now talk to projects that might have a thousand devices or a million devices, and we're comfortable that the cloud technology can scale elastically to support those situations. We're also using the service fabric from Azure in order to better process data, provide device logic, uh, and provide our own device connectivity framework. We're providing more value to the customer by being able to do more analytics on the data that we're collecting in the cloud. No one asks us to do IoT for them. What they ask us to do is deliver better value on top of the data that they are collecting. Microsoft Azure allows us to deliver better expertise to the end user customer. So one of the core capabilities that all IoT-based solutions need is a way to securely integrate IoT devices with the cloud. And Azure IoT makes it incredibly easy to securely integrate and manage any type of IoT device. It includes powerful data ingestion and command and control capabilities that can scale to handling millions and even billions of devices. And as part of the solution, it also makes it easy for apps to track and visualize uh, how the solution's performing, the data within it, and to integrate business logic and workflow. Now, developers can uh, integrate business logic with Azure IoT in several ways. Uh, you can run custom code and scale out logic uh, using our cloud-based infrastructure services. Uh, for example, VMs, cloud services, and our new Azure Container Service and Azure Service Fabric offerings. Uh, we're also uh, today introducing a new Azure service that makes it easy to integrate functionality with both Azure IoT and a wide variety of other scenarios. We call this service, new service the Azure Functions. And it enables a serverless compute option within Azure. 
Uh, this means you can now run code in response to events without having to provision or manage VMs or compute clusters. Uh, you can write this code using a wide variety of languages, including C Sharp and Node.js, and set it up to automatically execute in response to a variety of different events happening. You know, for example, certain conditions in Azure IoT, or a file being saved into Azure storage. Uh, and you can basically then trigger and run any code you want in response to that. And we'll dynamically scale up and manage it for you. Uh, there's no fixed price that you have to pay. Uh, instead, you only pay per execution of the code, which makes it incredibly cost effective. And in addition to delivering it as a service on Azure, uh, we're also making the runtime open source, which means you can run, take any app you build and run as a service on Azure, and you can actually also then deploy and run it on other clouds as well. What I'd like to do is invite Cameron on stage to show off how you can use the combination of Azure IoT and Azure Functions to very quickly get started on any type of IoT solution and scale that uh, to any size. Here's Cameron. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you. So as Scott mentioned, Azure IoT is actually a collection of hyperscale Azure services that are designed to handle the most rigorous of workloads. Azure IoT Suite is a product that stitches together those services into pre-configured solutions that are designed to get you started within minutes and allow you to customize those services to fit your needs. Let me show you what I mean by this. Over here, I'm over on azureiotsuite.com. And as I start to click through you'll notice those two pre-configured solutions that I just mentioned. And these two pre-configured solutions represent two very common patterns that we see out in the marketplace, remote monitoring and predictive maintenance. We'll have more to come here in the days ahead, but today I'm gonna focus on the remote monitoring piece. I wanna show you all you need to create one of these solutions is simply a solution name. You select a, a region and you just, decide what Azure subscription you want to deploy this solution into. Now, I'm actually not going to actually go deploy this right now. It takes about five minutes to deploy all the services into that subscription. Rather, I'm going to jump over to uh, a tab that shows uh, a solution that I've already pre-deployed. And what you see here is actually the results of all the orchestration of all those backend services coming together to give you this rich, comprehensive dashboard without you having to write one line of code. There's a lot of features, a lot of functionality in the Azure IoT suite. I, can, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I do want to drive your attention to this upper corner here where you see a graph. This graph is showing you the data coming off a particular device attached to the solution, specifically a temperature data that's uh, represented by this black line and humidity represented by the, the green line. What's not interesting is necessarily this graph itself, but what's happening behind the scenes that makes this graph possible. As we mentioned, a number of services working together. In particular here, you've got Azure IoT Hub and Azure Stream Analytics that's making this sort of thing possible. The other thing that's interesting about this particular graph is that it's real-time data. Real-time data coming from a device that I have here in front of me. And to kind of uh, exemplify the, uh, the fact that this is real-time data, I'm actually going to make this temperature, I'm going to cool off the temperature gauge here, and hopefully you see that black line here dip a little bit, there you go, which shows the, the real-time nature. That was a message going up from that device. You can do that all day long, that's fine. Thank you. That's great. So that was a message coming from the device up to the Azure IoT Hub. It gets crunched by a bunch of those back-end services and displayed right here. Now, I also want to focus one more feature of the Azure IoT Suite that I want to emphasize here, and the fact that I can create custom rules. And for this device, I've actually created a rule here. Let me focus in on that so you can see this. I created a rule that basically says, hey, whenever the temperature of this device drops below 20 degrees, I want an alert to fire, okay? Now, this is really interesting, and it's also a great spot where I can talk about the synergies between Azure IoT Suite and the newly announced Azure Functions. Because what I want to do is I want to write an Azure Function that is executed whenever this alert goes off. So let me show you what it looks like to create an Azure Function. Over here in the Azure portal, you'll see the Azure Function blade. I click the new function, 
And what, what I'm presented with is a number of templates that I can choose from. Azure Functions is, is such a great thing for the Azure IoT Suite customization thing because I don't have to think about things like what VMs am I going to have to go deploy and what's my CPU utilization. I can just focus on the event source that I want to associate this function to. And these templates give me a rich set of, temp of, of event sources that I can choose from, like event, tri hu event hub, um, generic web hooks, et cetera. For the Azure function that I prepared for this particular demo, I called it the IoT alert. And what I want to do here is I actually want to build up a message, Azure IoT, and I want to send that message, which you see here, and this is just simply no JS code that I'm associating with this, uh, this Azure function. I want to send a message to a device on this stage, and not just a device. I want to send it to this shirt, this shirt. And I want to send it to this shirt when the device here goes below 20 degrees. So now let me show you what I mean by this. So let me go back to the dashboard. And what I need to do is I need to reduce the temperature of this device below 20 degrees. Now it's kind of warm up here, especially in the fire retardant vest that I'm wearing. So let's see, I get this below 20. Okay, and then let me come over here and let's see what happens. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> the Azure IoT connected shirt. <laughs> now, we built this, we got this thing together by using, this is an Adafruit board that is part of the Azure IoT starter kits that we're going to be announcing today, along with a number of other boards, such as the Intel Edison board. Have a great build. Thank you very much. Really keep reminding Cameron before stage, just don't spill any water on your shirt. We weren't sure quite what was going to happen or if you'd be here. Um, so, you know, as you saw there, you can now build IoT solutions uh, using all the services and all the capabilities that Cameron just demoed there. Uh, and, you know, as you can see, it makes it incredibly easy to get started with IoT. And as you heard from BMW and you heard from Schneider Electric and others, you know, you can scale these solutions to literally any size and any type of scenario. In addition to the preview of uh, uh, Azure Functions and the Azure uh, Starter Kits, we're also announcing new updates to Azure IoT, including a new Azure IoT device management service, as well as the new Azure IoT gateway uh, device service uh, that are now also in public preview. And we got some great talks throughout the week that go into it more. So, you know, Azure Functions provides a great way to execute code in response to IoT events. And, you know, as applications get bigger, uh, you also often need the ability and the agility to enable even richer application logic. And a microservice-based architecture enables complex applications to be composed of small decoupled services that can be deployed, updated, and scaled independently. You know, Azure provides a uh, flexible set of capabilities that enable you to create a microservice-based architecture and enables you to ba basically balance both scale and control as you do it. At the lowest level, we have a new capability we call our uh, virtual machine scale sets. Uh, that provide a bunch of capabilities that make it easier to deploy VM infrastructure underneath. And VM scale sets have been in preview uh, the last several months, and I'm excited to announce that they're uh, being released in general availability form today. And then built on top of this kind of core VM scale set technology, we then have two higher level microservice-based compute services, the Azure Container Service and Service Fabric. The Azure Container Service provides a fully managed service that enables you to easily deploy and orchestrate applications built using containers. Uh, the Azure Container Service provides deep integration with Mesos, with Docker, Swarm, Marathon, and other technologies. And it supports the ability to run all this technology on both Linux as well as Windows Server-based container technology. And it's available in public preview today. Uh, the Azure Service Fabric uh, then provides an even higher level uh, container-based programming model. It's more of a prescriptive microservice framework uh, that includes automatic deployment and management of both stateless and stateful microservices hosted within Docker-based containers. Uh, it has both .NET and Java APIs and supports running in both Windows Server as well as Linux-based infrastructure. And just like Azure Functions, uh, the other nice thing about uh, the service fabric is it's provided both as a managed service within Azure, 
which means you can basically you know, spin it up just uh, without having to manage any of the infrastructure yourself. It's also then available as a separate runtime that you can then deploy into any Windows server or Linux virtual machine and run in any cloud, including Azure Stack, inside AWS, inside VMware, and OpenStack-based environments. We use Service Fabric ourselves uh, very heavily within Microsoft. In fact, much of Azure, SQL DB, and Office 365 are built using Service Fabric, and it scales to run across hundreds of millions of compute cores uh, and virtual machines across the company. And during the public preview of Service Fabric, we've also seen a bunch of great companies build their own solutions on top of it. And these are just a, a few of the logos here. One of the really uh, cool applications uh, and interactive applications built on Service Fabric is Age of Ascent, uh, which is a massively multiplayer game that runs entirely on Azure. What I want to do is just uh, show a quick video of them talking about their solution and how they're leveraging Service Fabric. We wanted to create a game of such massive scale that's never been created before. We really wanted it to run naturally in the browsers. Anyone can play it immediately, whether it's your laptop or your phone or your PC. We were building a system that could cope with huge demand and huge concurrency, huge availability. Around about the same time Service Fabric came about, say two alliances suddenly decide to go to war on a whim. They all meet in space at the same time to duke it out. Our microservices in Azure Service Fabric will automatically scale up, begin unfolding space, and seamlessly distribute the load across all the nodes in the system. We've tested it up to 50,000 concurrent players in the same battle arena. We were handling 267 million application messages a second. Our game microservices are built using ASP.NET Core. It gives us superior performance. ASP.NET Core is open source. That allows us to contribute back to it if we have any performance issues, which then Microsoft review, and together we make a better product. Our contributions to Kestrel have reduced allocations, lowered latencies, and allowed it to be already 2,300% faster than previous incarnations of ASP.NET and more than six times faster than Node.js. We run public player versus player alpha play tests once a month where anyone can just drop in. All you need is a modern browser that runs WebGL, turn up at the website, and you can play the game against other players around the world. And what I'd like to do now is invite Scott Hanselman out to walk through a real service fabric based application and talk about the benefits it provides. Here's Scott. Hi, friends. So we've just seen how Age of Ascent uses Microsoft Azure, ASP.NET Core, and service fabric to scale not just a massively multiplayer online game, but an ultra MMO. And now at this point at build, you might expect us to bring you Northwind in space or Contoso Trek, but that's lame. We want to try something a little different right now. We've got the real code from Age of Ascent running right here. I want to remind you that this is a professional 3D game running in the browser with no plugins on Azure. And I think that's Satya right there. Hang on. No, it's Googs. It's Googs. I'll get, I'll get him later, hang on. Now the back end is entirely on Azure using Service Fabric. If you look in that top left corner there, you can see that we're pushing 35,000 transactions a second right now. And as you saw in the video, Ben Adams, their CTO, is one of the primary committers to Kestrel, which is the ASP.NET open source web server, and he helped push it to over a million requests a second. Now this game here is running in Service Fabric Explorer. I'm going to switch over to Service Fabric. Age of Ascent uses hundreds of machines, and it, it scales in and out dynamically based on the load. And you can see here on the left that the game is made up of dozens of microservices, and each one is concerned with their own responsibilities. I've got training drones and machines and, clients and clans and alliances. And each one of these microservices will go and report their health up to the larger application. You can note here that all systems are go. Everything is green, therefore the overall app is healthy. Keep that in mind, that's gonna be important later. And I'm gonna split this and we will bring Solution Explorer up here. 
And when I said that this was real code, that we want to look at how this thing is built. And you can write your microservices in most any language, as we saw even Java on Linux, if it makes you happy. In Age of Ascent's case, they've chosen to write them with the high performance open source ASP.NET Core. See here on the right, we've got the microservices, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the services in Visual Studio and those in Service Fabric Explorer. And what's exciting about this is that you're already ASP.NET developers. You're already .NET developers. You already know how to do this stuff. Okay, so, so what's new? Well, when you start scaling your apps in the cloud, you can hit onto some hard problems. And Service Fabric solves the problems that happen at cloud scale. So let's talk about one of them, which is managing state. Okay? Age of Ascent is handling literally an entire universe of state. There's lots of things going on here, all different players doing different things. It's pretty hard to manage. And a good microservice will encapsulate their own state. But traditionally, that's involved pushing state to an external store. And that adds complexity, and then it can become a bottleneck. Service, fa service Fabric makes that a management of state more natural by letting it live side by side with the code so it's more like traditional object-oriented design, except it's scaled to the cloud. So for example, if I go here into the trade and industry service, this is, the real, this is some real code here. We can see how Age of Ascent is using these queue and dictionaries, but they are i-reliable queue and reliable dictionary to go and let players manage and upgrade their weapons. Now, scale this to millions of people doing it all at the same time, and it becomes an interesting problem. When I go and commit this transaction, the state change is going to be automatically replicated across the cluster. And it's going to scale automatically. And it's going to make it resilient to machine failures. Now, remember before, speaking of failures, that uh, I said each service rolls up and reports its health. You get to decide what a healthy application is. And you see all these ships flying around. Those are all training drones. Each one of those is one of these microservices out there thinking and working. And those training drones and the service reports its health up to service fabric via this health monitor. So we've decided what a healthy drone is. Now let's take a look at the training drones service. This might seem impossibly small, but basically it handles the creation of these little AI ships that are all flying around and uh, they'll shoot at me if I shoot at them. This code manages their creation and their behavior of the actual drones that I'm seeing in the game right now. But Service Fabric makes it easy not just to upgrade the app, but to upgrade individual services without downtime. Downtime's a problem in a multiplayer game like this. So I'm going to make a little tweak to Age of Ascent so that I can defeat uh, the evil uh, Guthrie, Nadella, Xander, Meyerson. Because uh, I don't like how hard the game is. They've stacked it against me. I'm going to make them weaker. Uh, here we see the uh, starting health is 100. Clearly, we'll just make that zero. Uh, <laughs> now, there are, there are runtime checks that are happening constantly, health checks, when I go and upgrade the service, so I don't have to really worry about uh, making a change like this. Now, I can test my updates locally with my own local instance of service fabric, but you know, I don't always test my code. And when I do test my code, I test it in production. <laughs> so. Thank you. So I'm going to go into Visual Studio, and I'm going to hit Publish, and we're going to go and publish this to the cloud. And we're going to make our drones a little bit easier to beat. Now, on the left-hand side, we've got the service fabric. On the right-hand side, we've got the game. Now, you notice it just popped. It just said upgrading, see? And this just clicked. So I can hit upgrade. And the upgrade is going to get staged across five upgrade domains. So at most, 20% of the machines will see the new behavior at first. OK? So I can go and fly around. I'm still in the game. Uh, Guthrie told me to take out Satya, and I have not been able to find him. The game is upgrading, and the change code gets rolled out to those machines, domain by domain, and the health checks are being run in order to determine if Service Fabric should continue uh, upgrading or whether it should roll back. So everything looks to be working. Oh, crap. So everyone is blowing up and spawning and then dying instantly. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, I should have made their health one. The classic massively multiplayer off by one error. <laughs> Sorry, awkward. Um, so, so that issue has been detected though, but look right there, it says upgrade state. Rolling back is happening in progress. Only 20% of the drones exploded and the game has now healed. I never stopped playing. Oh, Googs just went by again. Ah, he's just in my face. How did Service Fabric know that was a bad upgrade? Because the Age of Ascent code told us that health monitor looks for drones that were killed without taking fire. And then when I triggered that, when I set the spawn health to zero. Now, the universe can't stop due to a bad upgrade or a lousy developer, and Service Fabric makes sure that it doesn't. It's all running on ASP.NET Core in Azure. So what have we seen, right? We've seen how partners like Age of Ascent can create these compelling multiplayer experiences using a microservices architecture built on Service Fabric. And even though I made a coding mistake, the game not only continued running, but it healed itself. Now you can use Service Fabric today. It's released, it's ready for production. It's soup. All right, hang on a second. I think Googs is behind me and what is going on? God dang it. I'm not good at this game. Oh, crap. Guthrie! Oh. Thanks, everyone. Go to ageofascent.com. So we're really excited to announce today the general availability release of Azure Service Fabric. Uh, so everything that Scott just showed you there is now available in general availability form, and you can now build apps that literally can scale to any size uh, and even model the entire universe. We're also today making available the preview of the Service Fabric runtime on both Windows Server and Linux. Uh, this standalone runtime can be used in any cloud environment, uh, so you can even run it on other clouds like AWS uh, or on-premises in other uh, virtualized systems. And we think this big, again provides you know, fantastic developer productivity uh, and fantastic choice and flexibility in terms of how you build your solutions. So let's switch gears now and also talk about some uh, additional great capabilities we have in Azure, uh, specifically the ability to use data and intelligence to infuse richness into every app experience. So Azure delivers a rich set of data, analytic, and cognitive services that enable developers to build smarter apps. Uh, with Azure, you can store and process any volume, variety, or velocity of data uh, and run real-time analytics and machine learning algorithms against it. And as you saw in Satya's keynote yesterday, uh, we're also now delivering higher-level cognitive services like speech and vision APIs that are all built on top of Azure and which you can easily integrate into any app to deliver even richer uh, end user experiences. And customers are delivering some pretty amazing solutions using all of these capabilities. Uh, AccuWeather is you know, one of the customers we're working with who have just immense amounts of data, literally trillions of objects stored uh, inside the Azure storage system. And they're deriving real intelligence from it that changes the lives of millions of people. Let's watch a quick video about their solution. We're looking for above normal snowfall. A major storm system. Widespread travel problems going to be a concern all throughout the day. The promise of the cloud is that every individual and organization has unlimited access to information at any time, no matter where they are. It's been a beautiful Weather affects us all. The Microsoft Cloud gives our team the power to instantly deliver critical information to people whenever they need it. Here at AccuWeather, we get up to 10 billion data requests every day from over 200 countries and in 100 different languages. The Microsoft Cloud allows us to scale up so we can handle that volume. I remember a woman and she said, the AccuWeather app woke me up in the night with a severe weather alert and I got my family to safety and you literally saved me from a tornado. And to us, that feels really good. Please, please join me in welcoming uh, Christopher Patty, Chief Technology Officer of AccuWeather. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate the opportunity. So, so tell us about the impact AccuWeather has on people's lives. Sure. So weather is one thing that impacts every one of us. It's very, very personal. Whether deciding to take an umbrella 
to work, to go on a run or a bike ride, or something as serious as getting a life-saving severe weather alert where literally every second counts. We rely on the Microsoft Cloud, and people rely on us to get that information out as fast as possible to keep them informed and safe. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about how AccuWeather is using big data to really make this difference? Sure, so big data really is the heart of what AccuWeather is. We're really a big data company. Everything starts with data. And we're creating intelligent weather solutions using highly predictive, visual, and interactive with Azure as the foundation. In fact, we're now taking 15 billion data requests every day worldwide, and that's resulting in trillions, actually two trillion storage objects all inside of Azure Data Lake. And you know, two trillion objects inside Azure Data Lake is pretty amazing. Can you talk about you know, how it's helping you, you know, handle the challenges of really managing all of this data? So weather data is complex. It's actually one of the original big data challenges due to the size, scale, real-time requirement, and location of the content. And with Microsoft Azure, we're able to scale instantly and have absolute reliability, which is critical when severe weather hits. Using other products such as machine learning and Bing predicts basically allow us to provide very important content to our end users as fast as possible and allow us to create innovative solutions that are targeted to their individual markets. And in addition to providing, obviously, the consumer experience of your app, you're also a leading provider in commercial weather analytics. Uh, can you tell us about this part of that business? Sure, Scott. So, so we serve over 200 of the Fortune 500 companies. And basically, our goal is to give them data-driven decision solutions based on the world's most accurate weather information. We're streamlining our processing of all that big data using Azure Data Factory, and that's allowing us to really innovate what we're able to bring to our customers. We're also about to announce a Power BI pack to allow the world's most accurate and detailed weather information to be brought to a large global audience in a product everyone's familiar with. Awesome, so, so what's ahead for AccuWeather now? So Microsoft's mission is to empower everyone on the planet to do more. And that's our focus also. We want to be able to give the most accurate data in the quickest way to save the most amount of lives. People depend on AccuWeather. What we do is so important. We literally save thousands and thousands of lives. With the Microsoft partnership, we can be assured that we have you protected when the weather is at its worst. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a bunch of great updates uh, to Azure this week in the data analytics and cognitive services space, uh, and a lot of great breakout talks covering a whole bunch of them. You know, one of the data services that, in particular that has a bunch of great enhancements is our managed NoSQL service offering that we call DocumentDB. You know, DocumentDB is a fully managed NoSQL database, which means you don't have to worry about infrastructure or patching or updates to it. And it can scale from just a few gigabytes of data all the way to managing hundreds of terabytes across the system. And what's great about DocDB is that it scales incredibly well and can support extremely high performance applications. Uh, you can literally run millions of database operations per second against it with extremely low latency. And it provides rich query semantics against all of the data stored within it. You know, and today we're announcing a whole bunch of updates with DocDB. Uh, you know, in particular, we're announcing a new pricing and scaling set of options that now allow you to scale how much data you want to store and how much processing power you want to do it independently. And this enables you to tune your usage even further and save a whole bunch of money. Today, we're also rolling out our new DocumentDB global database support. This enables you to automatically replicate your NoSQL databases across multiple Azure regions. And this enables you to take real advantage of Azure's hyperscale reach and the fact that it runs all over the world to easily build truly global applications uh, that have high availability and that can provide extremely low latency anywhere uh, in the world. And we're also excited to announce today that we're adding additional NoSQL programming models on top of DocumentDB. Starting today, you can now connect to DocumentDB using any standard MongoDB driver or programming API.
you know, this now allows you to take existing MongoDB tools, uh, libraries and skills, and take full advantage of our managed and scalable NoSQL database offering. For example, just yesterday we did a blog post uh, talking about how we've made it really easy to, to uh, port parse applications to Azure without having to change a single line of code. Uh, parse internally uses MongoDB to store data, and we're able to leverage this new MongoDB support in DocumentDB to enable this code to just work without any modifications. You know, one of the cool apps that's built on Azure uh, and is using our DocumentDB service is the Walking Dead No Man's, uh, no Man's Land game. Uh, this game reached the number one position in the Apple App Store uh, for free apps and handles just a huge amount of load and users. Uh, the app does more than one billion DocumentDB queries each day and sees latency of less than 10 milliseconds at the 99th percentile when it does it. And here's a quick video of them talking about their solution. We're really proud of the fact that we're actually helping the humankind to learn how to rebel the walkers and stay alive. Azure is a key part in that training. You have to be able to do that 24-7 just to be ready. Walking Dead No Man's Land is based on the AMC TV series. We can actually provide new content after each episode within 24 hours. I pretty much knew that with choosing Azure and Microsoft, I would be guaranteed with better support than I would get from any other cloud providers. We know that there's somebody there looking after us. In Azure, we have, I don't know how many hundreds of servers, but then again, why would I care? It's cloud. The latest addition that we've been starting to use in Azure is DocumentDB, which has really helped us to make our development cycles faster, and that actually enabled us to create a very engaging player versus player experience within the game. Many of the things that we would usually need when we're doing backend are already pre-figured out for us by Microsoft. And we were able to deliver such a high quality, engaging game with stunning graphics, good gameplay, and reliable technology. So in addition to enabling you to store and process data, uh, one of the things we're also focusing on and I'm making some exciting announcements this week is enabling you to bring data to life to your end users. You know, last summer, we launched our new Power BI offering at Microsoft. Uh, Power BI enables you to visualize and interact with data from any source, including data stored in Azure, uh, coming from on-premises databases, as well as coming from other SaaS apps and cloud solutions. And it works both within a browser as well as in iOS, Android, and Windows-based devices. I'm really excited to announce today that we're uh, enabling a new Azure service that we're launching that we're calling Power BI Embedded. And with Power BI Embedded, you can now take uh, the Power BI data visualization and reporting functionality and directly integrate it within your own applications. Uh, you can do this without requiring your users to buy or even be aware of what Power BI is. Uh, instead, you can basically take advantage of the Power BI Embedded SDK so that it just feels naturally like part of your application using the same authentication, login, and overall consumer experience that you're already delivering to your end users. And best of all, the pricing model for Power BI Embedded is just like any other service on Azure. Uh, you pay only for what you use without requiring any fixed upfront costs or any per user pricing. And this enables a very cost effectively uh, way for you to integrate data visualization and reporting functionality into all your applications. You know, Milliman is a great customer of Azure who deliver actuarial financial services to their customers as a SaaS-based offering. And they use Azure to perform massive computational analysis for their customers every single day, uh, with some of their customers consuming hundreds of thousands of compute cores uh, for a particular run. And let's take a look at how they're taking their solu existing solution and how they're looking to basically leverage and integrate the Power BI embedded functionality in it to deliver an even richer SaaS-based offering. Milliman is one of the largest actuarial consulting firms globally. We also do a lot of risk management. 
integrated as a cloud-based technology platform to enable actuarial modeling and financial reporting. Multiply that by our clients. We're in the hundreds of thousands, of course. That's a large number. Cloud was the best option for us. The complexity of these calculations requires massive compute power, and to have that on-premise is just prohibitively expensive. Pulling all those assets into the cloud using Azure Data Factory really allows us to drive the pipeline process. We're also using HD Insights to deal with structured and unstructured data. And then with Power BI, look at those data assets that we've pulled in across different departments and in different financial systems and do reporting and dashboards. Power BI was the only cloud-based analytics service that could be embedded in the Integrate solution. We have no hesitation or, or concerns that we can't scale to the demands of our ever-growing new customers. So Power BI can be embedded into any existing application in a really easy way, including, as you saw, the Milliman, like Milliman into any SaaS-based solution. What I'd like to do is invite Laura on stage to show off some of these capabilities in more depth and how easy it is to get started. Here's Laura. All right, let's talk about some data. I am super, super excited to show off the Power BI Embedded Service in Azure. We've already had a ton of customers who've started using this, including Milliman. And for their SaaS application, it's the right pricing model, it's the right delivery model. And for SaaS developers out there, Azure is the only cloud platform that gives you a service for rich reporting and analytics. What I want to do is I want to show you how this works. And we built our own sample SaaS application for Fabricam Aircraft Maintenance. And Fabricam uh, Aircraft Maintenance sells us out to a number of customers. And you notice that I'm logged in as a customer of Fabricam. Off to the left in the reports menu, I have a number of reports I can choose, and when I select one, Power BI just embeds the report and renders it directly in the application. As a customer of Fabricam, I don't have to worry about purchasing a separate product for reporting off my data. As an end user of the application, I don't have to leave the application to analyze my information. And for Fabricam, they get all the rich interactive visualizations and it let Azure manage the service. Power BI Embedded supports all the same visualizations you get with the, the standard product. It even will support those custom visualizations. These are very specific visualizations you'll create specifically for your, for your business. Now, Power BI Embedded is available in full public preview starting today. And, yep, yay! <laughs> So everybody can start using it today, and it's actually free until, I believe, May 1st. So everybody get out there and start using it. And what I want to do is walk you through how you're going to get set up with Power BI Embedded. And we'll move to the Azure portal. And we're going to create a new, under Data and Analytics, Power BI Workspace Collection. And a workspace collection is simply, it's a repository. This is some place where you're going to host your reports and manage reports for your application. Creating the workspace collection takes about five or 10 seconds. And then you can start loading reports and start baking them into your application. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go and create a couple of reports, and we're going to load them up into our app. So let's move over to Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop is a free tool that anyone can download. You can start using this and, and create your own reports. As a SaaS developer for Fabricam, the, the people that created the application, we used this to create the reports that we pushed out to all of our customers, to every one of their workspaces. But the beautiful thing is that I can also enable my customers to create their own reports. They can uh, connect to the Fabricam data, create the reports, and load them into their own tenants. Let me walk through that, uh, that scenario. So I'm now an, a user of Fabricam. I'm one of the customers, and I've connected to my Power BI, uh, or to my Fabricam data. And I want to understand a little bit about the, the business analytics. So we're just going to create a quick little report, 
And I'm gonna look at a couple of measures. So we're gonna look at lost revenue over time. And with just a couple of clicks, we can easily see that we had a big spike in lost revenue in the third quarter. Well, I wanna investigate a little further. So we're gonna add another visualization. We can just simply click and add another visualization out here. And this time I wanna understand how many parts, what were the cost of the parts, and then the lost revenue. I'm very interested in this over a type of aircraft in my fleet, and big bubbles in the upper right-hand corner means something's bad. So I have a couple of types of aircraft that are causing problems with lost revenue. Most important, I wanna see this over time. I just simply drag that time dimension and I can see that play over time. I can even interact with it as it plays over time. And I've got a great report that starts to tell me something about my business. That's pretty impressive. So I know something, but I need to go drill a little further. I'll do that later. But I want to share this report with other people in my company that are using the Fabricam application. So I'll save the report. Let's go back to the application. Now, when we designed this application, we connect, uh, used the Power BI SDK to create an experience to upload reports. And so as a user, I can come out here and I can say, well, I'm going to browse and I'm going to select my report that we just created. We're going to give it a name. Oops. Bear with me one second. Oh. We'll just take that. Um, and then we'll click Upload. When I click Upload, it is going to stream that document up to that Power BI workspace that was created earlier, and then it will render that document right in the application. It doesn't take very long. It's uh, just a couple of seconds, and it's available. Now, you'll notice that it includes all the same fidelity and uh, experiences that we had in the desktop tool, all within my application for Fabricam. So, So now you have a full experience with the rich visualizations that are available right within your application. Uh, you can go try it today. And, uh, and uh, Power BI is, uh, again, available for free until May 1st. Thank you. So the opportunity to build applications that can change the world has never been greater. And each of you now has access uh, to cloud resources that were unimaginable just a few years ago. There's never been a better time to be a developer. This morning we've talked a lot about uh, a lot of the great new capabilities that we're releasing this week with Azure, particularly in mobile, IoT, microservices, and the data and intelligence space. And combined, they enable you to build some really amazing solutions. You know, one of the things we decided to do uh, for this build event is actually all, not just deliver the features, but also deliver an example app that shows how to use all of these capabilities together, and which comes with a free ebook that explains both how the services work, but more importantly, how they integrate together to build real solutions. Uh, and you know, we basically are coming out with a new sample here, which basically demonstrates uh, how to build an IoT-based app that streams telemetry from any modern car uh, using Azure IoT, uploads it to the cloud, processes and analyzes it using a microservice-based architecture, that relies heavily on machine learning to drive insight and intelligence. And the solution then has a rich mobile experience for the consumer that works across Windows, it works across iOS, and across Android, all built with Xamarin. Uh, you can download the sample as well as the free ebook from the URL here. And we hope it provides a great way for you to get started and productive with all the technologies we talked about this morning. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the great solutions that you then build yourselves based on it. So yesterday, Satya talked about the three core ambitions we have at Microsoft. Um, Terry talked about the work we're doing with Windows to create more personal computing experiences, and I've now covered the work we're doing to build the intelligent cloud. And what I'd like to do now is uh, pass the baton over to Chi Lu, who's gonna talk about the great work we're doing to enable developers to take advantage of Office to reinvent productivity and business processes. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. It's great to be here to talk about the Microsoft productivity platforms. 
As Scott Satya mentioned, we have three big ambitions. And today, I will talk about how we reinvent productivity and why this is a great opportunity for developers. We're going to show you with code and demos. At the core of a quest to reinvent the productivity is to transform the way people and organization work by harnessing the full power of mobile and the cloud. This is at the center of our ambition and the company's mission, which is to empower people and the organization on the planet to achieve more. We are moving to the cloud. It's a massive undertaking to transform the office franchise from products into services and the microservices. We are creating significant uplift in innovation cadence and the values to users and customers. At the same time, we're also inventing new productivity scenarios for mobile endpoints, delivering more values and reaching more users. We modernize our code base. Now we can ship Office clients across all platforms at a much, much faster cadence, accelerate the pace of innovation. The combination of mobile and the cloud will significantly expand the productivity category, reaching billions of professionals and students, delivering more high-value services to them. But in order to achieve that full potential, we need a modern productivity platform. And we need a new ecosystem. We're investing very heavily to build platform extensibilities into all our services and the client endpoints. That will create a lot of opportunities for all the developers to be part of it, to create more values to our customers. And we have four vectors of innovation in building out the modern productivity platform. First is mobility. People are fundamentally mobile especially for their productivity needs. And the mobility will be built into all our products, into our platforms. And this will be a significant source of new scenarios for all the developers to participate to create net new values. Second is collaboration. We're moving beyond individual productivity into collaborative productivity, connecting people together enable seamless conversations at the new foundation, and they will create new context, provide new canvases for developers to engage with your users in highly enriching matters. Third is intelligence. In the world of mobile and cloud, data is the new oil, because with data, you can build models about how people work together, how work gets done. And these models provide insights and intelligence. In fact, intelligence is a new form of energy. It will fuel innovations in all our products, and they will be available through APIs to all the developers to tap into to drive innovations. Fourth is trust, and this is core to us. It's the Microsoft way, because our brand represents a trusting relationship with our customers and the partners. And we are doing all the heavy lifting of security, compliance, information protection, all built into our platforms so that developers, you can all leverage so that your offerings will be more secure and trusted. So put all these together. We have strong value propositions to all the developers. First, we have the largest commercial user base. Today, we have 1.2 billion users using all versions of Office product. In the cloud, we have well worth more than 60 million users, monthly active users on Office 365 commercial cloud and growing very rapidly. More than 85% of the Fortune 500 companies use one of the Microsoft cloud services. 
and we're adding over 50,000 small businesses every month to Office 365. And this is also a very, very highly engaging user base because the typical Office users spend two to three hours per day in our apps. And our goal is to reach multi-billion users in the coming years as we expand our mobile footprint. As of today, our mobile install base is already over 340 million downloads. Second, we have large-scale data sets. Over 4 trillion emails sent to days already. More than 3 billion minutes of calls every single day. Over a billion meetings each month. All these are high-value data. For example, a meeting that includes information about the people, the subject, the documents, and a lot more. So combined, these data provides very rich context for your applications to take advantage of. Third is intelligence. We have deep data intelligence in our offerings. As I mentioned earlier, intelligence is the new energy for innovation. And we are investing very heavily to build new infrastructures, machine learning capabilities, and the deep data models to distill insights and intelligence. Data intelligence is already driving a lot of product innovations across Office 365. For example, Delve, organization analytics, much more. And these data intelligence is available through APIs to all the developers. In fact, the API call volumes has been growing very rapidly, over 420% months over months. So let's get it to be more concrete. So the Office Productivity Platform provides three specific developer opportunities. First, developers can build intelligent applications by accessing Office 365 services, large-scale data sets, and the deep analytical insights, all through the Microsoft Graph API. You can build web apps or native client apps, and here you can take full advantage of all the powerful Azure services Scott just talked about. Second, you can integrate your own solutions into Office apps using the Office adding extensibility mechanisms. You can take full advantage of the rich context of the Office apps and engage your users in the high value environment. Third, you can integrate your services into the conversations within Office using Outlook and Skype. And these two conversation canvases will provide new and powerful ways for your services to engage with your users. Now let me talk about the specifics of the first developer opportunity. We'll start with the Microsoft Graph. Microsoft Graph is a unified single API endpoint. It enables developers to access a suite of Office 365 services, such as Outlook, SharePoint, OneDrive, Azure Active Directory. You can use the standard REST API calls with JSON payloads, or you can use SDKs. We have SDKs for web and other platforms. Now, to access data, you can implement a single sign-on using Azure Active Directory and send a data request through OAuth 2.0. And here, you can access all the data sets within the Microsoft Graph. Conceptually, you can think about the nodes of that graph is a set of entities. And these entities include the users, the documents, the emails, the calendar events, the tasks, the conversations. The edges of the graph are the relationships, such as the documents you're working on, the people you're working with. We also provide real-time support. For build this year, we're adding webhook support to the Microsoft Graph so that your applications can respond in real time to the changes to the data. And furthermore, we're adding a lot of deep data models that provides rich, powerful insights and intelligence 
that's super helpful for a lot of applications. For example, the documents that are most relevant to a user, the best time for group users to meet, and the people who are most relevant for a given topic, and the list goes on. And all these insights are available through the Microsoft Graph API. Now to show how you can build an intelligent applications by using all these capabilities, let me invite my colleague, Yena Arenas, to show us code and a demo. Let's welcome Yena. Thank you, Chi. Hello, Build. Microsoft Graph is the gateway to data, insights, and rich relationships in Office 365 and the Microsoft Cloud. And to show you, I'm here in graph.microsoft.io, where you can find all of the information that you need to get started with the Microsoft Graph, including an updated Graph Explorer. This is a simple web application that allows you to make web requests to the API and see the response right in line. With this application, you will see that I can get back very simple JSON describing the properties of my user profile, just going to the me segment. From there, I can go to additional data that is behind the Microsoft Graph. For example, use segments on the navigations to get access to additional data, like the photo or the value of it. Now, Microsoft Graph also gives me access to data and insights coming from multiple services, like users and groups from Azure Active Directory, documents from OneDrive, mail, calendar, and contacts from Exchange. Here I have a request to get my, the group membership for my user and get a list of groups that, my, that I belong to. If I navigate to one of these groups, notice that I get the group description right away in plain, simple JSON. From here, I can do a simple navigation to the conversations of this group that are actually stored in Exchange. Full, update, delete, and create operations are supported. In this request, I'm going to create a meeting invite on my calendar. If we go to the split screen, you will see that as soon as I send this request, the service and the Outlook experience gets updated right away. <laughs> now, I said data, but we also have intelligence behind it. With this API, this is the Find Meeting Times API that based on a couple of users is going to calculate, the intelligence in the graph is going to calculate the best times that I can meet with them. No longer I have to do that. The API take care, takes care of it for me. Now, in addition to the Find Meeting Times API, I want to show you the people endpoint. People is going to it's another intelligent endpoint that is going to calculate, based on my sig the signals of my activity in Office 365, what is the people that I work with. These people cannot may not even be part of my team. And they're right there because I work with them based on all of the signals in Office 365. Now, let's go and see one of our partners, DocuSign, and how they're using this infrastructure behind Microsoft Graph and all of the data and intelligence behind it to make their application more contextual and smarter. DocuSign is a service that allows to easily digitally sign documents. And if I need to start and send a document for a signature, you'll see that DocuSign has integrated the OneDrive file picker that is going to allow me to select files from my Office 365. If we take a look at the code, we'll see that DocuSign is basically making a very simple JavaScript function that instantiates the picker, sends a couple of properties, and launches it. I'm going to select one of these files. And now DocuSign is going to give me the option to select the contact that I'm going to send this document to. Here, DocuSign is leveraging the intelligence behind the people API, and the search capabilities within it. So I can type the name of a contact. 
and the People API will return me a match even if I mistype their name. Now, not only matches based on contact names, but also based on topics. So I'm going to type Jupiter, which is the name of a project that we have been working on. And the people endpoint is going to calculate all of those contacts that are relevant to this particular topic. If we take a look at the code, we'll see that DocuSign is making a very simple REST request to graph.microsoft.com to the people endpoint, passing in the keyword as a, as a query parameter and getting back plain JSON that they can parse with JSON convert and get back into the view. Once I select a contact for signature, DocuSign is taking it a step further, and they're reading that this user is out of office and allowing me to select an alternative contact to, to complete this workflow. I'm going to select this contact, and we're going to look at the code. Again, it's a very simple REST request to the mailbox settings endpoint to get access to the automatic reply settings. Very simple way to get access to data and contextual information coming from the Microsoft Graph. I'm going to complete this form right here. And now DocuSign is going to grab the document, grab the user, and create the envelope for signature and allow me to place the signature placeholder. This is how DocuSign is leveraging all of the data and intelligence behind the Microsoft Graph to bring and create more contextual applications for their users. I'm going to do the signature place right here. And there you go. Thank you. Back to you, too. That's, thank you, Ina. That's a concrete example to show the power of the intelligence in Microsoft Graph. Now let me talk about the second developer opportunity, which is to integrate your own solutions into the Office applications using the Office adding extensibility mechanisms. We have three specific benefits for developers. First, we made it very simple for developers to build Office add-ins by using common web technologies. They're just the CSS, HTML5, JavaScript, and the modern frameworks. And you can add a simple XML manifest that describes how your applications will integrate into Office. And then you can use a collection of JavaScript APIs to interact with the Office apps. For example, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook. Second, we are making the Office add-ins available on all platforms and on all devices. The Office add-ins already run on Office for Windows. Office for web, and Office for iOS on iPad. Today, we are announcing the support of Microsoft's Office adding for Office 2016 for Mac. This is yet another important step forward in making the Office platform available everywhere. And you can use add-ins to create native experience that's tightly integrated within the Office apps, such as custom menu buttons and the custom ribbons. And these application experiences are very simple to use and easy to discover. Third, we provide modern distribution capabilities. Users can install add-ins themselves by going to the Office App Store. And Office 365 admins can deploy add-ins to the users or to the groups within their organizations by a simple button clicks. And as soon as a user signs into Office, through CT5, these add-ins will be immediately available from within the Office apps. Now, to see how you can make your own solutions be a native part of Office and be available on every platform, uh, once again, let me ask Yuna to show us more code and more demo. Thank you, T. I'm here in Visual Studio 2015 with the latest version of the Office tools, which we are releasing today and are available for download right away. Within the, yes, within the new wizard project, I'm going to, you will see that I have a whole bunch of selection of the different add-ins that I can build 
in Excel, Word, Outlook, PowerPoint. All of them taking advantage of the new capabilities for ribbon extensibility that allows you to create applications that look and feel like they belong to Office. Now, I'm gonna do a Hello World application, and I've already created a little project here. And an Office add-in is basically made out of two parts. One is an XML file that describes how that add-in is interacting with the Office host. And the second one is a web application where you can build your custom experiences and will interact with Office. Here I have that XML manifest. You'll see that it has basic description of the add-in itself. But I'm gonna focus on one part, which is the new ribbon extensibility. In this control element, I'm gonna create a button in the ribbon in Excel that is gonna launch a task pane. This is a web task pane that allows you to create custom applications on top of that web experience. Notice how simple it is to describe, and you can set all of the different properties right away. Now I'm gonna create a second ribbon button, and this one, instead of opening a task pane, is gonna execute a JavaScript function. Full IntelliSense from Visual Studio is supported, so here in the actions, you'll see that I get the options of the supported actions. My function name is gonna be Hello World, which is described right here. And now I'm gonna to go to the JavaScript file that is gonna execute that function. I have a little skeleton of a function here called Hello World that instantiates the Excel context. And I'm gonna take this context, and you will see that right there, I'll get full intelligence from Visual Studio from the Excel objects that I can interact with, like for example, the workbook. And then I'm gonna call get selected range and the values. And what I'm gonna do is just gonna say hello world. Now that context is gonna synchronize back to the Excel running application. And once I run this, Visual Studio is gonna package the add-in, install it with that running instance of Excel, launch Excel, and I'll see those two ribbon buttons right there. The first one is gonna open that web-based task pane. Here you can build any custom experience. And the second one, based on the selection, is gonna place Hello World on each of the individual cells. This is how easy simple web technologies, JavaScript and HTML, and you can extend experiences within Office and bring new functionality within it. Now, I'm gonna show you a partner that is taking this technology to make very interesting email features. I'm here right in Outlook, where I'm gonna reply to an email message and you'll notice right here within the ribbon, I have this group called Boomerang. Boomerang is a partner that builds email productivity features right within Outlook. The first one, remind me, is gonna launch an office dialogue that is gonna allow me to select a set of times where I want to get a ping back if this user doesn't reply to my email. So I'm gonna say, remind me in two days, and off it goes. And now, in addition to this, Boomerang is gonna use native dialogues within Outlook to show me what's going on. Here I have another ribbon button, which instead of launching a dialogue, is gonna give me options in a drop-down menu. Each of these will execute functions based on uh, my selection. Now let me show you another one, suggest so times. Suggest Times is gonna again launch an, a dialogue from Office, and it's going to, Boomerang is going to go and call the service APIs on my calendar to create this visualization, allow me to select a set of times where I can meet with this person, and then you'll see that the user is right here, they grab all of that information from the email, and then I can insert those options right into the email. 
on the receiving side, the user is going to get one-click scheduling. And again, they're going to use the service APIs to create that meeting in our calendar. If we take a look at the code, Boomerang is making a very simple request to, their, to actually an, uh, a function that is running on their service that makes that service call, takes the calendar, and creates that image. This service is running in Azure. And once they get that image back, the integration with Office is two lines of code to get that back and insert it into the body of the email. This is a great set of productivity features that feel like a native part of Office. Now, I'm going to go to the iPad. And I'm going to show you how Office add-ins are cross-platform. I'm going to start in Word. And I have here an adding from a partner called Office at Work. Office at Work builds data-driven document wizard for creating professional-looking documents based on data in Office 365. I'm starting with a blank template of a non-disclosure agreement. And I have this wizard experience on the right-hand side that is going to allow me to select data from a list in SharePoint. These organizations, each of them have a template associated to it. And once I select one of them, Office at Work is going to use the latest version of the Word JavaScript APIs to change the look and feel of the document. In addition to this, there are a couple of placeholders in this document where I'm going to select a user. And again, based on those APIs, the update on the document is instant. This is another example of how simple it is to integrate with Office. This same add-in works here in the iPad, in the web, in the desktop, and in Mac. Activity. Now, one of the most innovative companies on the planet, and one of my favorite, is Starbucks. And they are making a strategic bet on Office to op open up a massive new opportunity to meet new customers in new ways. To show all of us how that works, please welcome the Chief Technology Officer of Starbucks, Jerry Martin Frickingers. So good to see you. Thank you, Chi. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with Microsoft on the stage, but it's also great to be back in the Bay Area. I spent many, many years living here and only recently moved to Seattle. In fact, uh, I spent 30 years, Chi, in the Silicon <laughs> Valley, working in high tech, uh, the last eight and a half years at Adobe Systems. But today I want to talk to you about Starbucks. And many of you don't know that Starbucks, inside the wonderful coffee shops that you go to and behind the baristas at the bar, there is a lot of technology. And I want to share with you some of the innovative ways we're using technology and also show you how we are now leveraging some new offerings from Microsoft to do add-ins. But first, let me talk about technology at Starbucks. We are full of IoT devices. In fact, retail is becoming hyper-connected every day. Here's just one example. We have a Clover brewing machine in many of our stores. And it's actually using proprietary technology called CloverNet to interconnect and drive the brewing recipes on these machines. We have a lot of data. We do about 90 million customer transactions a week. We know information about what people are buying, where they're buying it, how they're buying it. And we understand things about our distribution channel and our inventory. And when you think about that big data problem, it gives us an amazing opportunity to stitch data together and provide personalized experiences in our stores with things like music, but also personalized experiences for our customers that give them special offers. How many of you have gotten a happy birthday treat from us? So data is a big part of what we do. IoT is a big part of what we do. But we, at the heart, at Starbucks, are about the human experience. And one of the ways that we have recently engaged digitally with the human experience is through our mobile order and pay applications. 
In fact, today, 17 million people use that application to order and get their Starbucks coffee, and 21% of all of our transactions in the U.S. are not done with cash, they're not done with your plastic credit card, they're actually done with your mobile pay on your phone. So we have already seen that our customers like innovation, they like interacting with Starbucks in new and interesting ways. And as we started thinking one day about how can we take some of that Starbucks magic and bring it closer to our customers, we had a couple revelations. And I wanna start by asking you all a question. How many of you have ever received a Starbucks gift card? Yeah, well, that's not all, almost everybody here, but actually one in six American adults this last holiday season received a gift card. And people love giving and receiving these cards. So we thought, wouldn't it be kind of cool if we could make that just a lot easier, like three clicks away? So Ina is going to help me out here on stage, and we're going to show you some of the things we've been working on that you'll be seeing very soon available from Starbucks and Microsoft. So we added a add-in for Starbucks. You'll see it up there uh, in the ribbon bar. And we're going to go ahead and pick a thank you card. And Chi, you've been so great today that I want to send you a gift card in email. And you'll notice that while I'm just standing here talking, uh, Ina is doing some very simple point and clicks. She's going to pick $100 because I'm feeling generous. I, uh, wow. You love wow. coffee. <laughs> and right now, she's verifying my credit card through password. Here's one of the little pieces of magic. We have linked the Outlook identity with the Starbucks identity. And through this, there's this lovely seamless integration to all of your rewards and the things that you normally do. And I'm going to go ahead and send this card to Chi, and we're going to go to a mobile device, and we're going to see what happens when we pick up that email. And you're going to notice a little more Starbucks magic, so watch closely as we open that thank you note, get a little animation, and look at that. It's a co-branded card. So another thing you're going to see is as we release this, you'll have the opportunity, maybe you want to give gifts to a whole team of people, and you want to co-brand them in some way with your project. So you'll be able to do that. And now, you know, there's that nice green Redeem Now button. Let's give that a push and see what happens. Remember when I talked about you walk into a store, you pay with your phone? There you go. You just carry that into the store and you buy your coffee. Awesome. <laughs> what do you think? Easy. That's so cool. Three clicks <laughs> and you're done. So here's another area that we have noticed a lot of interest in the workplace. How many of you have walked into a Starbucks with your PC or phone and had a meeting? Use that great Wi-Fi. Half the room. Easy. Half the room. So let's say you want to go have a meeting. You hop in to set up an appointment. You click on the Starbucks ribbon. Here comes the map. I'm going to go to 3rd and Howard. Let's go meet at 3rd and Howard. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. OK, so here we are. Meet me at Starbucks. I'm going to send that invite, and I'm going to notice when it, we receive it on the cell phone side some of the cool things we can start doing. So the invite has gone out. We're going to hop to our mobile device now. I'm going to open up that. You see that's the same meeting request. And I'm going to hit Order Ahead. And you're going to notice we're going to deep link right into that mobile application. And now we are ready to go have our coffee at Starbucks. That is so awesome. Thank you yes. so much, Jerry. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Now, I hope you have seen the power of the office platforms, especially the combination of data intelligence and the big user base. As, as a developers, one of my dreams has always been to have an environment whereby my code can have easy access to lots of data and deep data models. And I can also write UIs very quickly and push to a big user base. And today, this is available as part of the Office platforms. And this is powerful, powerful foundation for all the developers to drive a lot more innovation. Now I'm going to talk about the third developer opportunities which is to integrate your services into the conversations within Office. Yesterday, you all have heard Satya talk about the platform shifts, the power of intelligence, digital assistance, chatbots, and conversations. What this is about 
is the rise of a new application platform with a new app model that's so powerful that it can unleash the full potential of mobile and the cloud. Now, this is beyond the web and the mobile application platforms. Well beyond, for sure. The web is a very powerful application platforms. However, the web usage on smartphones has always been less than 15% since iPhone was launched in 2007. It works for simple tasks, but the usage will be limited because the web just isn't designed for small phone factors. Mobile application is also a very powerful platform. It works very well for head apps, but does not work well for tail apps. For things that you use once in a while, for example, check the ferry fare. Why should you download and install an app, taking up the resources? Now, even if you do, after you download and install hundreds of apps on your phones, you can't even manage and discover anything anymore. Apps simply do not cover the long tail. And then we know human needs are long tail. There needs to be a better solution. And the conversation emerges to be a powerful new platforms, whether it's WeChat in China, the chatbots, the digital assistants such as Cortana, they all point to the same direction. At its core, at its core, this new platform enables conversation to be the new interface for users to discover and access any information and to interact with any services to complete their tasks without downloading apps and without visiting websites. In fact, conversation can be a full-blown platform because for any domain, for any tasks, you can always represent that using a conversation dialogue plus interactive cards. So this means for most GUI applications, you can always write a conversation interface or a conversation apps that provides the same functionalities. Now this app model is very powerful and it's ubiquitous because here, human language becomes the interactive UI. Since we're all human beings, this UI works everywhere, on phones, on PCs, on cars, on drones, on robots, on smart things, you name it. And this UI works for everyone, even including my mom, because yesterday you probably heard Satya talk about my mom, because I tried so hard for so many years, failed to convince my mom to use digital technologies, but WeChat did the trick, and that shows the power of that new paradigm. The long-term potential is enormous, and Microsoft has what it takes to play a leadership role because we have strong assets in conversation canvases, Cortana, Skype, Outlook. We have strong data sets. We have strong technology. We have strong developer community in all of you, and we have strong momentum. You have all seen the demos yesterday of Skype, Bot Framework, and all those. But even more importantly, we have the leading productivity platform. And we can lead in commercial conversations and lead in commercial conversation platforms. And the developer opportunities are here and now. Specifically, we're announcing two concrete opportunities for your services to engage with your users through conversation starting today. First, we're announcing the general av availability of Office 365 group connectors. Connectors enables developers to create conversations about objects that represent your services. And users can choose the familiar tools, such as Outlook, to have conversations about those objects. For example, a question on Stack Overflow, a feature request from user voice, and so on. Furthermore, developers can associate smart actions to those objects so that users can take actions from within the conversations. 
And this opens up a whole lot more opportunities. Second, we're announcing the general availability of Sky for Business SDKs for mobile and the web. This SDK enables developers to facilitate conversations among their users, sort of audio, video, IM, presence, all from within the Sky for Business canvas. And these capabilities are available both on-premise and in the cloud. To see how that works, one more time, I'm going to ask Yuna to show more demos. Thank you, Ji. Office 365 groups are a great way for people to come together and collaborate inside of Outlook. Groups have a shared space for calendar, for files, a notebook, and they have a conversation section right inside the Outlook experience. Here I have an engineering support group where we collaborate on big technical issues. And in this group, we also have connectors. Connectors are a great way to integrate activities, alerts, updates from your service right into the group conversations inside of Outlook. This is the management page for connectors. And every single member of the group can configure a connector that gets information into it. And one of these connectors is Sendesk. Sendesk is, offers a wide variety of customer support for workflows. Customer service tools that allow businesses of all sizes to manage their customer support. Within Sendesk, when a new ticket is created and needs support from this engineering group, I can escalate that right here within the Sendesk experience. This particular ticket needs escalation, so we're going to go and submit one. What is happening is the Sendesk is making a post request to the webhook endpoint of this particular group to create a new conversation around this ticket. When I go to the Outlook experience, we'll see that activity right there. Sendex brings in all of the relevant information, and here we can have conversations about this particular issue. I know that Sarah is an expert on the area, so I'm, I'm going to add mention her. Here the group can collaborate on this particular issue, and once they find a resolution, Right within the ticket, I can reply into Sendesk. Get all of the relevant data and close the case. Now, connectors are a great way for integrating data into your group conversations. Like she mentioned, today we are announcing that you can build your own connectors and submit them to be part of this catalog. We have more than 60 connectors that are already being part of it, including Trello, Bing, MailChimp, Sentry, Stack Overflow, and many more. Now I'm going to go from text-based conversations to video and audio-based conversations with Skype. We're going to launch an MD Life application. MD Life is a leading telehealth provider that is working with Skype and Office 365 to bring contextual experiences right within the phone. This quarter, MD Life is releasing a new version of the application that leverages the Skype for Business app SDK to create video based and audio based conversation right within this experience. If I want to see a doctor, the application is going to have my profile right there. And then it's going to bring me a list of doctors with their availability powered by the Skype SDK. I can see all of the doctors that are available, navigate to one of them, and see their profile information. In this case, I'm going to just select the doctor on call and start a video conversation with him. After a couple of questions about the symptoms, my medical history, 
and my preferred pharmacy, I will be able to start the conversation with him. Now I'm going to be placed in a virtual lobby while MD Life is going to find the doctor for me. There he is. If we go back to the view of the doctor, you'll see that MD Life has he, their web application and the Skype experience embedded on it because they're using the Skype web SDK. This is powerful, seamless, and connected experiences for real-time communications right within the MD Life experiences. Now, Skype for Business and Office 365 are HIPAA compliant, and the platform can be used by every developer to deliver secure, trusted conversations within their own application. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuna, for all those demos. Give a big hand to Yuna. So all those demos, I hope they provide you a concrete picture of the emerging powerful Office platforms. And I want to call out two additional resources you can use. First is go to dev.office.com. There's lots of information there, including documentations, code samples, and training materials. And we also have a number of sections this afternoon. We start with a session providing an overview of the Office platforms, and we have each sessions that are dedicated to each developer opportunities. Now, in closing, you have seen incredible innovations across Microsoft platforms over the past two days at Build. To see how all these come together, one way is to look through the lens of Microsoft partners who are innovating across all those areas. Now, to do that, I'm going to invite my colleagues, Steven Guggenheimer and John Shuchek, to share some of the conversation and the examples of Microsoft developers. So please welcome hey, Steven Chi. and John. How are you? Thank you, Chi. Thank you. Big hand for Chi, his first build. We're happy to have him here. Pretty good stuff. Well, so I hope everybody's holding up OK. We're going to sort of take that last lap. Um, John and I are here to take all of the pieces we've seen over the last two days and bring those together through the eyes and lens of the partners we get a chance to work with. Um, and for us, you know, this has been a journey we sort of talk to developers and our team does on an ongoing basis for the last couple of years. And the conversations have really evolved. The first year or so, you know, the conversation in a mobile for cloud, first world, Microsoft, you know, do you get it? It's not all or none, all Microsoft, all Oracle, all IBM, all Apple. We're sort of past that. The Salesforce partnership, the Box partnership, the Dropbox partnership, the Red Hat partnership, and on and on. People are there. You take that and the open sourcing of .NET, SQL on Linux, we're sort of past that point. So then the second conversation becomes, in an all or none world, of all the pieces we've seen, where do we spend our energy? Because nobody's going to use everything, but it's also true that hardly anyone uses nothing. And so we try and work with folks to find the right thing at the right time to help them move their business or their ideas forward. And then the last piece, which I think we're the most proud of and the teams are the most proud of, is showing up. And that's not showing up with a set of PowerPoints. It's showing up with a set of developers who will sit down and code with people, either in the community or with an ISV for a day, a week, um, and doing that year in and year out. And so some of the partners we'll show today are folks we've worked with over the years, and some of them are new. And you'll see some videos and demos that bring that together in the sense of that ongoing relationship. And to kick that off, we have a, a video from a partner we showed on stage last year, actually. Our partner was Music. Do you remember that one? Yes. Yeah, so that was the group where we had the cool Bluetooth drumsticks. We sat down with them, coded that up. Yeah. And doing some new stuff. So we're doing some new stuff with them. Well, they've got a new developer on their team, and we got a little clip of the video of him starting off there and getting, getting his head around this new platform. So maybe we should run that video to kick this off. All right. Wheat grass. It's for my brain. I'm about to become a triple threat. Ooh. Ooh. This thing on? This is what I realized. I'm an A-list movie star. I'm a comedic rock star. That's only two things. So what I'm about to do, I'm about to become a tech god. I suggest you buckle up. What are these? What are these? 
is a new super smart music headphone. See, it's got me thinking about creating my own app. Ah! Surprise! A Kevin Hart app. Full of sexy. How do you beat yourself? up on that. For words, I come in, I take place of the words that would have came out of your mouth. They become my words in the app that I create to where I say what you said, but like me. Genius. You walk down the street, you got your music headphones on, you see a fly girl you want to talk to, boom, Kevin, what do I say? You say, come here, girl. I'm in your air. You want to eat, but you don't know what to get? Ask Kevin. Fettuccine. Girl, you want to get some fettuccine? Google uh, fettuccine. Two T's. I didn't know that. So good. I'm so smart. <laughs> well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A triple threat is born. Goobs, I got you, man. Put me in, coach. You got me sitting on a bench for no reason. I'm your star player. I don't know how to log off. I always have problems signing off for this thing, and I end up staring at the people a little longer than I should. All right, I got to have a little fun. So the guys at Music, their real product is this, uh, besides the drumsticks, is this headsets. They'll come into the market in the uh, summer this year or end of spring. And the cool part of this is they've got a set of buttons on the side that are programmable. So they've programmed them, for example, if I sit up here and I press the button, it'll tweet out the song I'm listening to. And they've got another button that connects to Spotify. What they wanted to do is turn this into a platform for developers so all of you could program against the buttons and basically create a software platform on top of their hardware headphones. Yeah, so we brought a bunch of their engineers uh, to Redmond, we sat down with them, uh, a bunch of our interns got involved, and we coded up an SDK that would run on iOS, on Android, and on Windows Phone that makes it incredibly easy for almost any developer to put together one of these applications. So great example of just working together yep. to make this stuff. Year in, year out, and uh, by the way, we'll, we'll tweet out that video a little bit later on. Now, we wanted to get in a couple of other conversations. That's one around devices and IoT and stuff we have a lot of fun with. Um, the first one is next generation productivity. We wanted to take the pieces that she showed and some of the bot stuff and bring those together. So first demo, we're gonna come over here. Um, it's a company called Highspot. Uh, and so we'll see if we get the demo machines up, yep. And Highspot basically builds a tool to help salespeople more, more productive. How do you get the right content, the right case studies, the right slides, bring those together for a customer. And so if I go into their service, you'll notice here I can go into content, um, I could pick case studies. And what they do is they use a combination of tracking and machine learning to help figure out what actually works. So if I send content to a customer, does a customer actually read it? If marketing people, like we do, create a you know, bazillion slides, which ones actually work? So, and for Highspot, they're an AWS shop, and this ability to start connecting in and do one-click office editing, work with OneDrive, all that stuff ends up being a big way to make their, their app more effective and sell more. Right, so the starting point was Office uh, in Office 365, but the other piece is, if you go into reporting, um, they have a set of reports they were working on, but they realize that they need to not just connect into the Office graph, but their, their system of record for the employees, the sales information, so here they actually took Power BI and embedded it in. So even though we're an AWS shop, we now have Power BI running in their service, and if I click on, for example, 90 to 100, I can see what the top 10% of sellers are using in terms of content. So I can go figure out how to do that. So nice integration of Power BI, even though it's, a full, you know, it's an AWS shop on the back end. Great integration with the Office Graph. And then if I go into the other side, which is the Office add-in, if I go and start a new email here, 
Um, you'll notice they have that, um, in that high spot piece right in the ribbon here, which is what she was showing earlier, and I can click on that and I can go pull content. Now this is nice, but there's more way to add add-ons and bring these things together. Should we show a little bit? Yeah, so as Chi talked about, one of the things that we've been working with HighSpot on is a next generation set of Office add-ins. And as you can see over here on the screen, um, what I've got is a website hosted up here, um, up on Azure. And what I wanna do is I wanna take this website, which has got some code in it, we're gonna try and turn that into an Office add-in. So let's see that in action. I'm gonna go over here. And last uh, build, we talked about um, a cool project called Manifold JS. This allows you to take web content and bridge it directly into iOS apps, Android apps. Well, we've extended that so that we can now create Office apps. So watch what I'm about to do. I'm gonna say I want this to be an Office project, and I hit return, and that's it. We have actually created our first Office plugin. Let's actually take a quick look at it. Um, this, these Office add-ins use a manifest to understand what's happening. And as you can see, it's got things like the display name and so on. But Manifold put those things together. It also gives us a good way to understand what to go do next. So let's see that actually in action. And here's the idea. What they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to get that rich data and analytics about how presentations are being used right when you're in the presentation. So you can see, do people look at this slide? Don't they look at that slide? So to demonstrate that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go insert an add-in, and here is that add-in we just created, and I'm gonna go insert that, and there it is. Now think about this, this is a website up on Azure that's connecting into the code that is associated with this PowerPoint document. It's really a kind of an amazing thing. Now, if you saw, that was pretty easy to put together, but the reality behind building something like this is gonna be more complicated. How do you debug something like this? I mean, think about that. That's a website on Azure running inside a PowerPoint. Well, we introduced a pretty cool new open source project, again, last build, uh, called uh, Borlon, and I wanna show that off. So here's Borlon, and what Borlon allows you to do is use the web as the backbone for connectivity. So I've got Borlon over here. Let me do a little adjust so we can see these things maybe a little better. Um, and as apps connect, what they do is they reach back to the Borlon server, and what we'd like to do is identify this particular one. So I'm gonna say identify client, and notice what happens. It picks, it shows that number one in my list is this particular PowerPoint. So I'm gonna click on that, and we've got this new plugin, a new tab for Vorlon, which allows us to actually go in and in real time look at what's going on here. So here's the context. I can see some of the functions we've created. And you'll notice I had selected some content inside that Office document. I can actually go actually test that out. So if I say go get selected data async and I invoke that, uh, you can see it's pulled out of Office into this add-in, we're able to go manipulate it. And I can go the other way, of course, so here's selected data async. Um, I can pump hello world into that, and if we go back here and look, uh, there's my hello world. I manipulated the, the document, I've used Vorlon to debug it. It's a really cool setup. Yeah, it's a nice piece of work, because last year we showed Manifold and Vorlon web to web, little applause for John there, and then uh, uh, this year adding PowerPoint in there, all the extensions, you see PowerPoint becoming more of a platform and using a standard set of tools. Now the next logical step in this is, if we were gonna continue down with HighSpot, um, if we think about the mobile phone and the mobile application, while the app is good, the other piece that might be interesting to them is bots. So let's take that bot framework and pretty quickly build a HighSpot bot that could be used on the mobile device. Right, so as you saw, uh, Satya talked about on the first day, we have these new bot frameworks. Um, so I've got a very simple bot framework that we put together. Let's just take a look at it in code. Um, and what we've got here is, a Node.js program. I mean, this is just standard Node.js. We're using a popular Restify library. We're including that bot builder. And notice what we're gonna do is we're gonna go create a new bot and we're gonna look for the ability to find presentations. That turns out for HighSpot to be a big deal. How does a salesperson who's on the road find that? And we think dialogues are a really good way to do that. Um, and as you can see, all we do is we hook it up, again, standard Node.js, uh, to HTTP. So to demonstrate that in action, let me just actually start this. So I type node uh, app.js, and we are off and running. I've got a little bot tester that 
we have that'll go talk to it. And so now it's pretty simple. I say find presentation. And look, it looks at the Microsoft graph. It pulls that information in. Let's take a look at what Steve's been doing, um, the, those reports that he was just showing, and we can click on those things, go immediately into high spot, see that case study. Uh, so it's a great way, another kind of extensibility that Highspot's doing with their app. Yeah, super easy way to use it. Now, before we do any further more on the Highspots, oh. you can have a lot of fun with the bot technology. So um, if we switch machines real quick, we created, uh, got together with our team, the C&E team, the Skype team, put everybody together, and they've been working on a Skype bot that's basically based on the old what-if concept. There was a what-if comic book back when I was young. And so, um, for example, here, if I type in what-if um, Scott Guthrie, uh, was a penguin, given all the good Linux, Linux open yeah. source stuff we've been doing. Make sure I spelled it right. And what it's doing is it's using all the services now that we showed off yesterday to parse the language, to find the photos, and voila. In fact, I'm going to download this. Let's blow that up a little bit. Oh, yeah, I think that works out pretty well. <laughs> So, uh, projectmurphy.net, uh, it's out in some of the kiosks. We're going to set that live. This is a Skype um, bot that you can play with within the Skype framework, and we'll let people have a little bit of fun with that. But it's sort of the power of what you can start to do when you mix the services together uh, and all the capabilities between Skype, um, Azure, and some of the other pieces. Now, back to the high spot side. The okay. last piece of this, you showed Vorlon um, as an ex uh, using this on the office side. The other place we use extensions a lot is with Edge. And we've yes. done a lot of work to get sort of standard setup working there. We didn't talk about Edge extensions at all, so maybe we can use Vorlon to do that. Yeah, so inside of Vorlon, one of the key uh, capabilities is the ability to reach out and look at HTML content and give the developer some notifications about whether that's standards compliant and so on. Now, you would have had to go set up a Vorlon server. You would have had to go connect to it. With the power of Edge and this ability to use web plugins in the standard way that's used across all these, we've created another quick and easy plugin, uh, the Page Analyzer plugin, so you as developers can get to this really easy. So let's say you wanted to look at the Highspot application, you just hit Run, and there it goes. It says, hey, you've used your prefixes incorrectly, and then the developer would be able to go through and do that. So Edge extensions have become uh, a key way to go extend the platform. Perfect. So that's a nice one that's available now. All right. Excellent. So good set of extensions in the line of business side. Um, if we sort of look at some of the people we've worked with, obviously, we just did the extension for the, that John built, but we also have Reddit, um, the Reddit Enhancement Suite, the Adblocker, Adblocker Plus, LastPass, Amazon, Evernote. Um, I had a chance to catch up with the Pinterest folks yesterday. They're working on one. So in good shape there. And then on the line of business side, you know, Box and Salesforce, our conversations in Dropbox actually started with the office side as a platform, all the things that she's showing. And those partnerships are getting stronger. As they sow the Skype capabilities now, integration with Skype is the next part of that conversation. DocuSign, Splunk, Smartsheet's another startup that's using all the different pieces of the Office platform. So for many developers, it might not be Azure, it might not be Windows, it actually is Office, Skype, and some of the other services that ends up being a great starting point for the conversations and one of the things that we, we spend energy on. Now, uh, in terms of the ISVs and partners, we didn't get a chance to show everyone, so let me just show a quick video of some of the partners we've worked with over the years to get a sense for how those partnerships continue to evolve. So let's go ahead and run that video. Gobbler's a cloud collaboration okay. platform for people that make music. Twitter's the live connection to culture. We want to help developers put out fires and find the guy with the matches. We've been using Microsoft technologies for you know, over a decade. Doing startup, it's awful, it's hard. And to make it work, you really need to find the best partners. I've been a Microsoft developer for 15 years. When we started Stackify, we naturally used Microsoft technologies. We started off working together in a more narrow way, but now, you know, five plus years later, we've taken that partnership and we've expanded it into so many other areas. Oftentimes, you work with a company and it's like, okay, well, this is what we care about this year, and then we're on to the next one, you know? And that has not been the case with Microsoft. This has been a multi-year relationship that we've had. In the time that we've been working together, it's actually been fun to see the evolution and to see that they're actually willing to take risks. 
they are able to communicate so consistently and so clearly where the roadmaps are going. For many of years that I've worked with Microsoft, they are very concerned about their developer relations. They always have been. We've been able to build a really great relationship with you know, engineering teams and support teams and platform teams. It's almost as if those engineers you know, are on our team and we have access to people that are actually building those products, the people that are the underpinnings of it all. They've always been there to help us out and not once had a uh, bad situation where we haven't been able to turn it around with Microsoft. It's been a continued interest in their wanting to see us succeed and to help us any way they possibly can. Each time we meet, each time we think about new partnership opportunities and areas to explore, there's a lot of appetite to really try to figure out new ways to work together. I'm so happy that we made this choice in the first place. We're excited to see that we can be partners for a long, long time. Yeah, my thanks to our partners for uh, helping us out and, and letting us talk a little bit with them. Um, the next conversation we end up in a lot is sort of that migration for commercial entities to the cloud. And that's a conversation we have all the time. Think Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, pretty much everyone. Uh, and many people start that dialogue inside the company by actually doing sort of a private cloud model first. Pivotal and their Cloud Foundry offering is a great example of that. Um, we spent time with them. Um, and Pivotal works with us and a lot of large companies. Ford's a good example where they want to move 1,000 you know, plus applications into the cloud. So first step then, if they're working with Pivotal, is to find some, some ways to connect between the work that they're doing and then Azure. And in that world, open source is a great way to go. There's lots of libraries, there's lots of opportunities to connect between what people are using today and some of the work we're doing. So I've got Rita Zhang on stage with John here, and they're gonna walk us through a little bit of the work we're doing in this area. So Rita is on my team. She's an open source engineer, works down here in the valley with a lot of startups and uh, companies that are using open source technology like Pivotal. And one of the things she's done is make it very easy for people who have been building applications to move them over to Azure. One of the things we often see in that kind of scenario that Steve was just describing, where people have code on stage, is they want a code in on-premises. They want to be able to move it up to the cloud. They often start with things like AWS. So Rita, what did you do to help make this easier for people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in order to improve the migration experience for a lot of our customers and developers, um, what we've done is we partnered with a San Francisco startup called Bounce Storage uh, on a solution called S3 Proxy that essentially enables uh, enterprise companies and developers to continue to use their existing code, um, leveraging AWS Java SDK to communicate with multiple storage uh, providers like S3 and, and Azure um, uh, storage. So let me quickly show you what, how that works. Um, so as you can see here in my application, um, I am using the uh, AWS Java SDK to talk to um, AWS to retrieve some content. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is um, uh, quickly change that to talk to um, S3 Proxy so that um, I can basically use a S3 Proxy to get content from Azure Storage. So as you can see here, I am uh, still using uh, AWS Java SDK. Um, so I'm passing in my storage credentials, and instead of talking to AWS, I pass in S3 Proxy as my endpoint. Um, so what I'm going to do is quickly um, save this and just build it really quickly. And S3 Proxy is not Cloud Foundry specific. Um, it can be hosted as a standalone uh, Jetty application. But here we've deployed it as a containerized application on Cloud Foundry because a lot of our existing applications are now in Cloud Foundry. So let me just quickly do a CF push so that um, I can get my updates deployed. Now, all this code you've written is up on GitHub in your repo. Can we take a look at that and tell us a little bit about what you did there? Yeah, definitely. Um, everything we do is open sourced. Um, so if you want to follow this end-to-end -end demo, you can definitely do that. Here's my repo on GitHub. Um, and this also walks you through how to deploy S3 Proxy in Cloud Foundry. Um, and here is the uh, specific code for S3 Proxy. Um, definitely let us know if you have any issues. So let's see that in action. Um, yeah, so now my update is now pushed to, um, to, to Azure, so this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just curl it, and this is now retrieving data directly from Azure storage. Yeah, so this is a great example of where we're working with the open source community, partners like Pivotal, with technologies like Cloud Foundry to make it easy for people to take their applications and move them onto Azure. Now, once they get to Azure, 
um, we often see that they want to take advantage of additional Azure capabilities. Let me give you a quick example of that. Um, as Rita showed, we've got this library that's enabling us to switch easily from that AWS S3 to the proxy-based solution that Rita came up with. Let's, um, let's also extend that now, and let's, um, let's just uh, write the code to uh, make this work from Azure. So here's the Azure SDK work now. Um, notice that we're going to use Azure connection strings. We're going to connect into that same code. But the model remains the same. And so all we need to do is we need to go into that code, replace uh, what we had put in the controller. And we are, oops, we're off and good to go. Now, the fun thing about this, the kind of amazing thing is we're also working to take the same technology and get it working on Azure Stack. So if you think about this, you have the ability to start with applications on premises, grow it up to start using cloud capabilities, take advantage of things like platform as a storage, and then go all the way to have this thing run as a platform using Azure Stack. And the Pivotal Cloud Foundry is now available in the Azure Marketplace. I think they went live this week. That's yeah. right. All right. All right, great. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Rita. Thanks for coming out and helping us out. Big hand for Rita. <laughs> the there's a number of partners we're working with uh, on the Azure side, uh, Hortonworks and Cloudera and Datastax and Mapper. The Mesosphere folks, we've had somebody probably coding in their office for the last year. Docker, we talked about Red Hat, we share that sort of um, hybrid model mentality, which is why it was easy, not easy, but it was logical to partner with them. Um, Hewlett Packard just moved their Haven on demand and they were, uh, got about 60 machine learning REST APIs uh, onto Azure. One I wanted to highlight here was Sigfox. On the IoT side, Scott talked about, they're building a network that allows you to use very low power chips um, so you can do very cost effective devices. So as opposed to using either cellular or Wi-Fi, they've built a very low power uh, network. Works literally about 100 kilometers away. They've set it up all over France. They're going to Antarctica. So if we did the old pedometer on a cow, you can put a pedometer now on a penguin, I guess, and track it around. But it's the kind of infrastructure that's running against Azure that's going to help us scale IoT in a very unique way. Uh, way. Cool stuff. We'll get a blog on that one out pretty soon. We didn't have a chance. It's actually very hard to show low power chip, low message setting demos. They're not really that cool. They're just sort of hard to do. But it's very interesting stuff. Um, because we were talking about the community, as well as working with ISVs, we spend a lot of time in the community. So let me run a second video now from the community aspect. We have a lot of new technology coming out that's driving innovation, whether it's virtual reality and augmented reality, the internet of things, big data, and these are great opportunities as a student to get involved in. Microsoft is coming onto campuses across the globe, helping students to use technology in whatever field they're in. With developers, it's really on us to think of ideas that can create solutions no matter what task you're looking for. Microsoft and Spotify came together to do Hackfest. It was true collaboration between the two companies. Spotify and Microsoft are thought leaders in their respective areas. So combining the teams together really helped us focus on a problem space that was completely new. Microsoft as a big company, we didn't expect them to be this open. They perceive each of their partners' success as their own. So there was this team spirit there, which really helped us get to that goal. It was beyond what we expected. We're seeing Microsoft be in a lot more community-oriented and take over the community sponsorship role. And they've actually invested quite a bit in these user groups, which have really spawned things like code camps, hackathons and office hours. It's just a great resource. From a startup perspective, there are a ton of benefits with partnering with Microsoft. From the technical resources that they can provide us to help us develop and enhance our product, to business resources for helping us connect to customers and partners that we would never be able to connect to. Microsoft is really showing up and actively engaging with us by just reaching out to us every single week and just asking us what we need. If we want to get connected to a certain customer, two weeks later, we'll have a meeting with them.
It's been really awesome seeing Microsoft engage with the open source community. It's really easy when companies decide to do open source to have their employees go on to these online spaces, but Microsoft has really made an effort to make sure that they're out in the physical world, whether it's meetups, hackathons, conferences, the kind of conversations that you can have face to face are so much more meaningful than someone typing in a text box online. I'm really grateful that Microsoft has decided to engage the open source community and are building these really fantastic tools that help everyone build a better web. All right. Thanks again to our partners and a ton of the evangelists that, that do the community work and some of our RDs and other folks are here. So if you want to get out and code, there's HackFest going on. There's people to talk to. Um, last scenario, um, one of the favorites, that's that combination of hardware and software and actually the cloud, bringing those three things together. And there's, there's just a ton of good work going on. A couple quick examples. Square Enix we had on stage last year, they bring together the very best of hardware, high-end hardware and high-end graphics and artistry, really. Uh, and their new game, which is uh, Hitman 4, um, they do with IO Interactive as one of their studio. They're now extending all of that sort of real high-quality gaming and using the cloud on the back end. Uh, for the AI work, some of the stuff that Scott Hanselman showed. Since Scott showed a bunch of it, I'm not going to run it here today, but that one's a very cool piece of work and brings those two things together. Now, the second one, uh, I want to pop over and, and to the Surface Hub here. Let me have them bring this to life. This is a company called Aviva. Aviva's out of the UK. They're actually about as old as we are, close to 40 years. And they've been building Win32 and then .NET apps for a long, long time. This is actually UWP. And what they do is they build the software used for building oil rigs, the largest ships in the world, really complex mechanical infrastructure. And if you see here, I can move this one around and you can sort of zoom in. If you want to get an x-ray view, you can get an x-ray view. If you want to tap on an item, you can tap on it. And you can actually go in and get the drawings. And what they've done now, this is, you know, collaboration for them is sort of heart and soul. So this device, and then connecting to OneDrive and OneNote, and then Skype, allows them to work across the world, allows them to collaborate, communicate, share the documents, use OneNote. So they really love the combination of sort of the platform for Windows, the cloud on the back end, and then these new, you know, category of devices. Now, last one on the devices side, uh, VR, AR, lots of conversations going on. Um, and so we thought we'd do one demo there. This one's kind of fun for us. The, um, the folks at Euphoria build basically a, a middleware toolkit for building augmented reality scenarios. They've got about 200,000 plus developers, about 250 million downloads. Um, so in the same way Unity is used for gaming, these guys are building the tool set for, um, for AR uh, in particular. And they're bringing their SDK to Windows. So let me, I've got an application here from Caterpillar that I'm going to launch on my um, device here. And so I've got this little category, Caterpillar app. And what we have here is a page from a cata uh, catalog for Caterpillar. And so if I go to this standard sort of catalog a salesperson would send over or you'd bring out, and I bring my Surface device here, what you'll notice is I have a model now, a 3D model rendered there. And if I turn the page around and actually see into this, I can get closer, I can get further away. And the nice thing here is because it's a Win30, or sorry, it's a UWP app, nice, um, I can click take note here and take advantage of the hardware. And here I'm going to make a note to change uh, the bucket on this loader at some point, and I'm going to save the note. And now you'll notice the change notification just hovers above there. So we're mixing that sort of hardware, software, really cool capabilities, and this new tool set from Euphoria. Can we show a little bit of this? Sure. So um, what you can see up here on the screen is Unity. We're inside the Unity engine. We're using the Euphoria plugin. And at the core, what Euphoria does is it allows you to take a target image and then map 3D models on top of that. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, of course, when you're doing this um, for something like this where we're building the catalog and have salespeople running around, we would do this a little bit more dynamically, but this shows the basics of the system. Right, and right. so I've actually now connected the two of them together, and really that's the core of the application. Let's actually run this thing in Unity, and as you can see, I've got a camera up here, and there is that same experience that Googs was just showing. Um, where we're able to map that thing on there. It's pretty cool. Again, you can zoom in. You can see all the way that this works. Now, because it's in Unity, one of the great things that this does for Vuforia is it means they can produce an iOS app. They can produce an Android app. They can also produce a Windows app. And that Windows app is special in that you can use those things inside a Visual Studio and extend them. So let's take a look at that. Here is that salesperson app 
that allowed people to go in and communicate with their customers. And you'll notice this thing is a XAML app. There's all kind of standard stuff. And as Kevin talked about yesterday, one of the key things that we're adding um, is this great inking capability. So I'm just going to drop in an ink canvas, and let's just go look at kind of the complexity associated with that. It's really surprisingly easy. We're going to just take stroke inputs, we're going to collect them up, and then what we're going to do is we're going to store them in a notes manager with the XY position that we had. And there you go. That's a way that we can take this great plugin, we can combine it together to produce a UWP, and that gives us the ability to get this out to a lot of different platforms. Yeah, I sort of moved over here because if it's a UWP, then by definition it should run on any Windows device, and since it's a 3D model, the next logical thing to do is to run this in HoloLens, right? So I have that same catalog page over here, and if you see I'll hold up my um, Surface, and there's that same cat, um, same loader. Now. Hi, how are you? Good Hi, to Steve. See you. Hi. Hi, Bill. Yep. Um, my brain's gone flat. <laughs> Margo's here to join us, and she's going to help us with the HoloLens version of this now. So what I'd like you to do is, yeah, put on, put on the HoloLens, and she's going to look at that same catalog page and see it from the HoloLens view. So go ahead. So she sees the same model. If you notice, even the change note is there. But the cool thing is because she's using HoloLens, she's not tethered then to this piece of paper or the catalog. She can bring this catalog to life. And so why don't you go ahead and bring this, uh, take the loader and go ahead and put it on the stage for us. Great. Happy to trigger that animation. <laughs> and what's unique about this mixed reality experience is that prospective Caterpillar customers can View the Caterpillar at true size and scale, leveraging the existing human and environment understanding APIs that are already available in Windows today. Yeah, so here Margo can walk around the loader. She can see all the different pieces of it, look inside the cab. It's a very cool scenario. And as a salesperson, I'll tell you, if I had something like this, night and day in terms of selling against Kubota or some of the others. Um, the other thing is we made that change notification so she could actually go ahead and modify this loader um, in sort of the life-size version. So can you go ahead and drive that change? Absolutely. Caterpillar, change configuration. Oh, I like that. So when they talk about the magic of software, I, I think it's all right there. So hardware, software, the cloud, bringing it all together, real world scenario. Thank you, Margo, for helping us out with this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Big hand for Margo. Thank you. So that's cool stuff. Um, lots of work going on on that hardware, software side, you know, hire, bringing Cortana to their appliances. Sensoria, we had them on stage uh, two years ago. They built th basically threads that are alive and they put them into socks and now they're starting to work with uh, NBA teams. They use the cloud on the back end. NASCAR, PGA doing some very cool work with hardware, software, the cloud. Um, you see it in all the things they're doing as the PGA goes forward with uh, their shot link system and NASCAR with in-car video, the way they check cars. Um, tools, Vungal on the ad side, but Envelope VR is a startup. Super cool. We'll have to do a video on these guys as well. What they're doing is they're actually creating an environment where you can wear your virtual reality headset and code. So you can actually write the code, you can edit, you can you know, work on it, and then look at your project inside the headset. Never have to pop back and forth between coding and then sort of looking at the VR project. So that's going to be a much better way to operate, and we're looking forward to those guys coming through uh, uh, in the future. So uh, with that, I, can you hand me my clicker over there? Up top there you there. go. Yep. With that, I want to sort of do one more step, and that's the connection to students. Um, one of the things that John and I get to do is work with a lot of the different student groups, and that's just fun for all of us. Um, we had the finals, or have the finals, of the Imagine Cup for the United States here this week, and we'll do the worldwide finals in Redmond in July. Lots of different teams. There's some cool projects going on. I saw one on, on sort of gun control, which I really liked, one on police safety. There's a ton of games that are going on, some health-related ones. The one in the middle is pretty cool. These are four juniors from MIT. They're working on a project that allows you to take uh, a reader, essentially, bring it over text and convert it to Braille in real time. So you can basically do books or text conversion to Braille real time, and sort of a really nice project ties in a little bit in terms of empowering everyone theme that Satya showed yesterday. So they're sort of next door. I think, John, you're judging? I'm judging. Yep, so judging tonight. is going on tonight, uh, and we'll get the U.S. winner. The second one, or part of this, is when we work with kids, we do a lot with university and high school, but kids are starting younger and younger. There's this really cool project called Quest, uh, which connects young kids and NASA together. And so let me run a little video on that. Right. 
This is the International Space Station. We're to mission lapse, time of seven days, 13 hours and 17 minutes. This is Mission Control, Houston. There's a lot to learn about how things work in space. These are the students, the new breed of innovators. We're trying to not only send this project up to space, but subtly we're trying to change the world. When you get a group of kids and tell them that they're gonna create an experiment that flies up into the International Space Station, they get so excited. We're looking how vibration affects metals in space. We go through all the processes that NASA has to do and make sure that it's safe for the astronauts. We've been able to create an experiment platform that allows kids to use the LEGO Mindstorm environments to create their science experiment and Windows 10 IoT to actually monitor, manage, and be able to run these experiments. Windows IoT has opened a whole new world of opportunities for us. It's not like we have to wait for three months to send it up and send it back. We get live feed from our project, see how our experiment is working and what's actually happening. We're pushing forward in the field of space exploration. That'll help in technology and science on Earth as well. We can actually see how small we are from there and how big the world around us is. The sky's not the limit anymore. All right, let me invite them on stage. Hey guys, how are you? You've got the kit, so we won't shake hands. So. Eighth graders from Valley Christian down in San Jose. That's where this project is run out of, but they go all over the world in terms of the project itself. It's really cool. When you think about getting kids interested in science, um, programming is one side, but space is a whole other uh, uh, angle to work with. So what did, you, you know, what did you guys each like about the project? By being able to just be in the project, it has clarified what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to become an engineer. I like that. Engineer, we need more of them. My favorite part about this project is that we can use Windows 10 IoT in .NET. And I know that sounds a lot like advertising, but... I did not pay him for that, <laughs> but we'll pay him later. Um. But with our old system, we were using a basic dialect from the 1970s. It had two kilobytes of memory. But now with Windows 10 IoT, we can use the entire platform that Microsoft offers with things like .NET and Azure and Visual Studio and C Sharp. We can use these things to make our experiments. So now, rather than just writing scripts, we can actually make apps and cloud services. I really love the fact that we were able to create something that's never been done before. And Googs, working with your team has really helped us to make the impossible possible. Oh, nice. These guys are great. The, uh, this experiment, give them a hand. Their experiment goes into space on May 31st. Um, so we'll check back with them in three months, six months, and see sort of the data they're getting back. So really cool scenario. Thank you guys for making time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Big hand. I, I couldn't even offer to get them out of school for this. It's spring break here, so they actually took time out of their spring break. So I, I feel a little bad their day off, but it was really nice of them to join us. With that, look. We hope you've had a great build so far. We've got more coming. Um, one of the things I'm happy to announce is we're gonna take sort of build on the road, London, Melbourne, Toronto, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Warsaw, and Pune. Um, one day, long day, as you can tell from this morning, and then, you know, hack fest at night, so we're gonna go all in. Um, tw build 2016, registration opens 20, uh, April 25th. We're gonna try to get more space next year. Join us on Channel 9, join John and I online. We'll see you at the Yerba Buena Lane. We'll see the evangelists here. Thank you so much for all your time. We appreciate it.